Meeting to order. Madam Clerk, could you al allow information to those who may wish to participate from home? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I am happy to announce that we are um, now wide open to the public for our council meetings. The doors will be unlocked. We'll have plenty of seating in the room, no more spacing, and uh, come on down. <laughs> um, while I'm stalling to find the information on Zoom on my page. Here it is. Um, we still have the Zoom option available, so people can either call into Zoom at 1-669-900-9128 or log in at Zoom meeting ID 978-4219-1797, and that is at zoom.us forward slash join. And if you want to speak during the meeting, uh, raise your hand either virtually in the Zoom meeting or by pressing star nine on your on your phone. And we will, when your item is called, and we will get you in the queue, and we will call you either by your name or your telephone number, um, however you are identified in the Zoom meeting, and you will be called on to speak. Thank you. Will you now please call the roll? Mayor Whitaker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap. Here. Councilmember Jung. Present. Councilmember Silva. Here. And Councilmember Zara. Here. We will now hear public comment on closed session items. And Jane Reifer, please unmute. Yes, hello. Um, I wanted to, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I wanted to. Um, talk a little bit about something that's a little bit of an uncomfortable topic. Uh, and I wanted to do it here at closed session so it, you could hear it in detail in my three minutes, <laughs> uh, but, um, but not uh, have it uh, go to the full public until such time as it can be maybe vetted. Um, and it's regarding um, some irregularities in the Korean War Memorial issue. We were not able to speak about it last time. Pardon, the comments are only regarding the closed session items right now. Well, uh, okay, uh, so I can bring this up in the in the full public um, yes, if that's of more important. Uh, but I will say this: um, it was um, we. This item was under closed session many times. I assume because um, Friends for Fullerton's Waterways was interested in pursuing this legally at one point, and uh, and I know it was discussed under closed session. Um, but unfortunately, it is not this evening. Okay, and we could never tell if it was on the agenda or not because it, it doesn't, uh, you, you understand, it doesn't actually list the topics. Mm. Um, so, okay, all right, I will uh, bring it up under public comment then, okay, under thank uh, you. regular session. And there are no other Zoom comments. And no other announcements or anything? We shall adjourn to closed session. I call the June 15th, 2021 Fullerton <laughs> City Council uh, regular session meeting to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please explain to those at home how they might participate in this meeting? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this meeting is open to the public, and we have uh, quite a bit of seating available this evening. For those who would like to participate in the meeting via Zoom, you can go to zoom.us forward slash join or call 1-669-900-9128. Enter meeting ID 978-4219-1797. Um, if you are calling in and when it's time to speak on your item, press star nine to raise your hand. And if you're in the application, you can use the raise hand feature to indicate your desire to speak on an item when that item is called. Staff will call you when it is your turn either by the name in the system or by the phone number that you are logged in under. Thank you for that. Now would you kindly please call the roll. Mayor Whitaker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap. Here. Council Member Jung. Present. Council Member Silva. Here. And Council Member Zara. Here. We have a treat this evening to uh, provide our invocation, Pastor Jay Wu of One Life City Church. Pastor Good Wu, evening. thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you guys for this opportunity. Uh, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Lord, we pray for your, um, your shalom. We seek for your shalom over our city. God, we pray for your peace and your protection over the most vulnerable. Lord, we pray for your joy and hope to be restored in our communities. And we pray, Father, as we continue to move forward in the economy and all that's opening up, God, that there be wisdom, that there be patience, that there, that there, there would be grace uh, in the process. And we thank you, Father, for our city, for this city, um, for we love it and we love the people in it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Wu, a couple minutes to uh, tell us about your church quickly. Yeah, so uh, our church is located in um, the Maple community, and so we're on the other side of Maple Elementary. Um, so if you head down, there's a cul-de-sac, and there's just an open space. And so um, our church has been around for about seven years, and uh, we're a growing community. We made it through the pandemic, and um, we're looking forward to kind of this new year and what's to come. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I've asked uh, Council Member Fred Jung to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please rise? Mr. City Attorney, uh, do we have a closed session report this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, there's no report this evening. Thank you. I would ask at this time for ex parte communications reports from members of the council. Uh, do any council members have such reports? Mr. Yeah. Mayor, oh. I may. Okay. Uh, I met with the Police Officers Association, sir. And I spoke with the, uh, the, the pr president of uh, FMEA. Uh, at the request of the Police Officers Association, sat down and, and uh, watched a presentation. Council Member Zara, none? Okay. I also, at the request of the Police Officers Association, uh, uh, viewed a uh, PowerPoint report on statistics, on crime statistics. Uh, there were uh, f three officers and one consultant who were there. And with that, we do have a uh, presentation this evening, uh, Fire Marshal Nig to make the presentation involving fireworks safety. I don't know where my loader went. Hang on. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Doing Thank well. You. Uh, as soon as we get this loaded here, I'll go ahead and uh, move forward. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, Chris Nigg, your Deputy Fire Chief and Fire Marshal. As we approach this year's Independence Day celebrations at the, and, and at the request of the previous Council, uh, I wanted to take a few minutes to highlight a few basic firework safety tips and reminders about firework, uh, fireworks in our city. Each year, the Orange County Fire Authority tracks and provides a comprehensive study of all fireworks uh, all firework-related emergencies throughout the county. In 2020, Fullerton had eight firework-related fires, uh, in excess of $10,000 property loss, uh, approximately five acres of burned vegetation. Uh, Fullerton PD responded to roughly 320 fireworks-related calls, and ultimately 1,400 pounds of uh, fire illegal fireworks were confiscated, mostly in part uh, to Fullerton PD. Fireworks cause an assortment of emergency responses from the fire department, which also includes varying medical emergency, emergencies. As fire service professionals, we always recommend enjoying fireworks shows performed by the professionals. However, if you choose to do so in your home, or if you, if you choose to do your own safe and sane fireworks at home, please remember the following. Always read the instructions on any fireworks you purchase and discharge. Set fireworks up in a clear and open space. Only adults should handle fireworks. Wear protective glasses and gloves. Light fireworks at arm's length and then stand back. Never attempt to relight a defective firework. Never hold a lit firework in your hand. 
and always have a bucket of water, sand, or a fire extinguisher nearby in the event of, a, of an issue. Just as a reminder, in the city of Fullerton, the local ordinances are as follows. There is zero tolerance of any illegal fireworks uh, per fire, uh, Fullerton Municipal Code uh, 7.26.010, which is supported by the California Health and Safety Code. It is a misdemeanor and up to uh, uh, punishable by up to a $1,000 fine and, and or imprisonment. Safe and sane fireworks are only pr in permitted areas, and safe and sane fireworks are not permitted in any of our high fire severity zones. Any fireworks that are purchased in the city of Fullerton must bear the California State Fire Marshal seal as noted in this picture. Uh, 15 TNT booths will be permitted to sell safe and sane fireworks in the city. Uh, any other fireworks sold in this city will not be legally sold uh, per our municipal codes. The following flyers will be handed out e with each sale from the TNT booths and should be read thoroughly. They are both, they are both in uh, English and Spanish and highlight all of the aforementioned uh, information related to fines and imprisonment and what is legal to discharge in the city of Fullerton. Fireworks are entirely permitted in our high fire and very high fire hazard areas of the city, as established by me as the fire marshal, the Orange County Fire Authority, and Cal Fire. Generally speaking, those boundaries are north of Rosecrans to the west, north of Brea Boulevard uh, to the east, south of Imperial, uh, which is the city limit, uh, each east of Beach Boulevard, which is also the city limit, and then west of State College. That's very generally speaking. Um, as you can see in the slide, the, uh, the boundaries are, are, are not necessarily squared off, as mentioned before. Uh, for further reference, as, a, as it relates to somebody's specific address, please reference the City of Fullerton Fire website and where this map can be accessed and zoomed in on specifically. Finally, the Fullerton Fire and Police efforts this 4th of July are as follows. We have 38 signs around varying areas of the city uh, reiterating our Fullerton uh, Municipal Code and where the um, safe and sane fireworks are permitted only and illegal fireworks are entirely prohibited. From the fire department, we will st have a staffing increase of one additional engine company patrolling throughout the city having an increased presence, uh, which will also take part in fireworks confiscations uh, as provided by uh, the California Fire Code. Uh, we also have staff with two additional fire prevention officers who will aid in also having a presence in the streets, but also will offer as a collaborative effort with the police department and transporting uh, those fireworks back to our headquarters where we store them as we, so we can keep uh, the police officers on the road to respond to calls. Uh, we will also have an additional chief officer uh, to respond to calls, and then I myself will be patrolling the city as well. To speak to Fullerton PD's efforts, I'd like to invite up Lieutenant Arena to discuss their efforts. Good afternoon, Council. I will be the watch commander for the uh, 4th of July for the night watch. So in summary, I'm just going to read what our efforts are for that night. Uh, the Fullerton PD will staff three two-officer units that are specifically assigned to handle fire-related calls. These six officers will work on July 4th from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. During their shift, they will handle the majority of firework calls for service. All other firework-related calls will be dispatched to on-duty officers working on the evening of July 4th. The directed enforcement team has been conducting undercover operations. These undercover operations are directed at purchasing illegal aerial fireworks for sale on the Internet. In the past, these operations have resulted in arrest, citations, and seizures of illegal fireworks. Mm -hmm. Our social media team has initiated a campaign to inform the public that safe and sane fireworks are only permitted on July 4th, that aerial fireworks are illegal, our visibility and undercover enforcement on behalf of the Fullerton Police Department, and the location where fireworks can be dropped off which is Fire Station 1. Thank you. Before we leave this topic, I just had one quick question. Uh, I'm not sure for whom, but uh, we're in an exceptionally dry period, uh, also with uh, you know, occasional higher, higher winds, and uh, we do have uh, the opportunity, if it's an extremely dangerous uh, weather condition, to cancel even safe and sane fireworks, is that correct? Correct, which would be as deemed uh, necessary by the fire chief or myself as the fire marshal, correct? Right. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that people were reassured that uh, if it were exceptionally dangerous that uh, we would take action on that. Certainly. Thank you. Sure.
And with that, we are ready for public comments. Uh, these would be comments uh, that involve issues other than those appearing on the agenda this evening. As usual, uh, we request a proper decorum, a proper decorum from the public and also from the dais up here as well. And with that, you have up to three minutes to make your comments, uh, and we'll begin. Craig Sheets, born at uh, Fullerton St. Jude's. You guys all know me. And I got to rat Lucinda out because she's been just a great gal calling me back, and she's done her job well, very well. You're welcome, Lucinda. Anyways, uh, oceans are my main concern. You know, if we don't have rain and water, we don't breathe. Correct, Chief? Guns. Oh, could you please direct comments to the council only? Oh, so I can't talk to the chief? No, you go through the chair. Because I like him. He'll hear you. So anyways, uh, if you look at the photos that I've copied for you, and they're not in front of you at this time, which I requested, you're going to see a very ugly, very ugly colored one. Okay, this concerns all of us. It is catastrophic, and I've been talking about human beings in animal form. Chief, you, you're with me on this. Cat urine is five times more concentrated than in human beings. Dog urine has a content called urea. You can find it on the Internet. Go to the veterinarian. I am on this. I'm not going to stop. Urea has an acid form. And if you, if you got a dog, you see your lawn burned, the lawn doesn't grow. It dies. Okay? So we're going with that animal thing. Mayor, appreciate you. Well off to the oil platforms. I'm going to focus on the Gulf Ocean because chief of police and every chief beyond Fullerton knows there's cocaine, meth, heroin in every city, county, and state. Okay? This is a second storage to the military. There's like 4,500 oil scaffolds on the ocean. I mean, I, to my eyes, they shouldn't even be there. So let's go with that one. Then you got the diversion of offshore to inland machine guns. Green cards. I've already explained this to you guys long ago. The serial numbers will match. You know, green card to AK-47, that's not good. We're inviting trouble. Drugs, military brought over, like I said, the secondary auxiliary area is those platforms in the ocean. So with that, I'd like to uh, speak that cat urine and uh, dog urine is going to be continuous with Craig speaking. I appreciate you having me here. Chief, good to see you. Lucinda, sorry that, you know, you're such a problem child. And if we have anyone else who would like to address City Council this night, please line up on the wall behind the microphone so we can keep this moving along. Go ahead. Good evening. Hello, uh, my name is Jackie Dennis. Um, I am um, a homeless person. I live in an RV, and that's the issue I'm talking about. I believe it was two, uh, three uh, Tuesdays ago that the police came down to Walnut by the tracks and told me my RV was going to be towed. It was 8.30 in the morning when my friend called me and told me about the police presence on Walnut. I was doing my laundry, so I left my stuff in the dryer and went back to the RV on Walnut. I parked my car and walked over to the first police officer I saw. He told me my RV had not been moved in over 72 hours. I told him I had put the RV in neutral and pushed it back twice with help of my friend. The officer said that wasn't true, and he's lied. Two Two police officers went into my RV and tried to get my two kittens out because they said uh, pets can't be in there in the RV when they're in storage. Um, they could not find them, and I couldn't get them to come out either. Um, so they went. Uh, they were towed with the RV, and uh, they were in the to uh, tow truck the whole time. They the whole day. 
And fortunately, they didn't get out because I saw them later at night when it was dinner time. They came out. Uh, the kitty showed up that night, but I had the uh, RV back. I went to the police station and paid $220 to get a release for the RV. Then I went to the towing place on Lemon to pay $280 to get my RV back. I had to call another towing uh, service to tow my RV. That was $350 not to mention three $100 tickets in the last two weeks. Um, yesterday, the police were back, and I was told by a police officer that I was going to be towed again. I said, I can move the RV. I got in, started it, and it backed it up. The police officer slowly moved forward to another RV situation. Uh, one of the RVs was um, at a, a gentleman 62 years old, and. Uh, he has nothing except the RV, and um, one young police officer used the F word talking to him and uh, just trying to tell him how to get things done, and he, ca he came back on it, but he didn't swear. And uh, he, today I saw him, he's been up all night long and uh, walking around the city, and he doesn't know what to do, and he has no help to get it out of what I went through to get it out, he has no money. And uh, another one, same situation, same situation. He has a, tr a truck as well as a, one of those mobile things you pull. And so we're just uh, a mess. And um, no one's doing drugs. We're not uh, illegal. They just don't have any money. And we have no place to go. And we're just asking for a little patience until things get better. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? My, my name is Shelley Youngbauer, and I'm here to back up what Ms. Dennis has to say. Um, I've lived in and out of my RV for a while now, and I'm getting my situation cleared up, but I have seen, I had left state and I came back because I have some medical issues that's irrelevant. Um, I have seen in the last two weeks that I've been back a total lack of compassion or caring from the officers involved to the towing, to the attitude. I mean, I understand there are laws and there are ordinances that have to be addressed, but you don't have to treat people like there's something you scrape off your shoe. I mean, the way they talk to people, the way they talk to me, I mean, Officer Sal Salazar, I mean, he's screaming at me. Why are you here? And, and just telling me all these things that he's supposedly done for me, which he had not, by the way. It was the tri parish that helped me, St. Juliana's, and uh, Friar Dennis, they helped me. Um, somebody just has to have a little compassion, guys. This could be anybody in this room at some time. Most of us out there, we had jobs, we had homes, we, had, we weren't drug addicts or, or nut cases or criminals, and we're out here. And we're not gonna go away unless, unless you guys wanna shoot us or something, I mean, I don't know. But I mean, it's getting frustrating to not have anywhere and not have anybody give a damn. Thank you. Oh, you sweetheart. Thank you, love. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. First of all, very quickly, please have your traffic uh, engineer, your, your signal engineer, change the signals at Harbor uh, and uh, uh, Chapman back to automatic walk. I was there today and there was no walk uh, signals automatic uh, like there should be because there is absolutely no way I can get up to, pu uh, uh, to push the buttons to uh, signal that I want to cross. The other thing I want to talk about is I want to ask the council to talk to uh, the observer for the 4th of July. Uh, since we voted uh, uh, several years ago not to have uh, fireworks, I love fireworks, but we need to know in future, am I up, uh, we need to know in future if this is going to have to be voted again. And the thing we need to know is every year, we need to know how many calls the police uh, were made to the police, how many calls were made to the fire department and to the hospital. I understand 
that it's very, it's like uh, uh, pulling teeth to get information out of St. Jude, but we need the transparency. The people need to know uh, if there are serious problems on the 4th. If there aren't, uh, we don't need to uh, stop the uh, charity fireworks. But if there are a tremendous amount, which I hope they're not, uh, we need to go back uh, to uh, have it on the ballot. So, but the people need to know, and every year it should be published. Uh, each year, it was so much this year, so much next year, and so on and so forth. So if it should ever come up on the ballot again, the people will know what they're voting for. Again, thank you so very much. I hope we don't have any problems this year on the 4th. Thank you. Council and staff, my name is Jensen Hallstrom, and I would simply like to uh, thank the fire department and police department for presenting on the um, situation with fireworks in the, the past year, and especially for showing the detailed map where there are the high risk fire zones within Fullerton, uh, especially seeing that there was the rather a uh, large fire in the Brea Reservoir back, I believe it was October of 2019 or November of 2019. And I'd like to mention that there are still large uh, amounts of acreage that contain dead fields of black mustard, uh, which is an annual um, invasive plant which grows in, um, in Fullerton. And currently there are some parts of the Brea Reservoir, which are uh, acres and acres of dead uh, thatches of this kind of weedy plant, which can get up to six feet tall and uh, is very, uh, very good fuel for, for wildfires. I would hope that there might be some opportunities with some of the um, up and coming projects, including the Adopt-A-Park and Adopt-A-Trail for there to be some volunteer efforts to remove and um, and manage some of these uh, these large patches of dead weeds uh, so as to reduce the fire load in our local open spaces and uh, that is all thank you Curtis Gamble activists uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council. I'm, <clears throat> today I'm here to share with you some information um, that uh, may be helpful to the community. I'm, as you know, again, I'm, I'm an activist on behalf of the homeless and the residents, because what I do for the homeless is to benefit the residents. Um, <clears throat> but I always help the weaker people first, the ones that needed the help the most. Um, what I'm looking at is the uh, safe parking program. The, the RVs and uh, vans, and uh, um, they should be in the SB2 zone for, it's SB2 industrial zone for emergency shelters. Um, you know, three years ago, I, not three years ago, but um, in 20, it was 2016, I did a lawsuit, a three year lawsuit. Um, with the Legal Aid Society, we have that we agreed to zone that for the for the basically for the emergency shelters. Well, <clears throat> people are using their RVs as emergency shelters. Okay, so that zone they do have somewhere to go. The homeless people do have somewhere to go, and I would just like to see us work with them more. Um, <clears throat> LA is doing a pretty good job. Well, trying to do a good job. Uh, they have. Uh, passed a new rule that says that uh, you can have shipping containers homes. These are self-contained homes. Um, that is now legal, tiny homes. We need to look at that also. Um, the other thing is the American Rescue Act. I want to share this guys with you. Um, the American Rescue Act is, um, let me say, the city of Fullerton received the first part of, 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 of uh, $16.3 million on May the 17, 2021. The city will receive another 16.3 about a year about a year later. The American Rescue Act is for 
basically it's for emergency housing vouchers are for, for the homeless. It's for people who are experiencing homeless. It's for at-risk homeless. It's for recent, recently homeless or, or homeless that are fleeing, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence or sexual assault, uh, stalking or human trafficking. This money, $32 million, is for those people who are coming here speaking, saying, I'm in my RV, I don't have a place to go. This is, they should be the priority for this funding. And that SP2 zone, that's where they're supposed to go. And we have open spaces where they can go, city property, where they can go for right now. But we want them to be where the, where the residents has clearly voted for them to go into the SP2 zone. Kimberly, well, it's Goodman property now. <clears throat> we pretend like we don't know about that zone. Every time I've talked to you guys about this, you say, oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so I'm going to work with you guys. Thank you very much. Seeing no further speakers, we will look to uh, Zoom uh, callers. Larry Iboshi, please unmute. My name is Larry Iboshi. I've been a resident of Fullerton for more than 50 years. And I'd just like to discuss one item. I think it's important that we we think about our city pride. And when I say that, I'm kind of looking at our streets is what I'm looking at. And I believe if we have streets that we're proud of, I think it would help bringing back us pride of our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are no more Zoom speakers. I, I always like to lag for a minute or two because sometimes we get complaints later that we had someone hanging out there. Okay, I'll take that as, uh, as a definite. Uh, we'll bring the discussion back then to, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Acting City Manager, do you have any comments at this time? Anything? Nothing present, sir. Okay, thank you. And uh, any other staff comments? This would be the time. Seeing none, I'll bring it to the council. Um, I'm sure. Council Member Jung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council. Uh, some a planning commission vacancy. Um, it's a directly appointed position. It is my planning commissioner who has uh, moved to fill the remainder term that expires in December 31st, uh, 2024. Applications will be accepted through June 24th at 5.30. The appointment is scheduled for the first July meet meeting on July 6th. Applicants must be 18 years of age and a Fullerton resident. Uh, please go to the City of Fullerton under Boards and Commissions on the City Clerk page and feel free to apply. Uh, that said, Juneteenth is Saturday. It's an opportunity for us all to appreciate African American contributions to our collective history and culture. We should also acknowledge that being black in America has challenges in everything from food choice, home ownership, health care, and policing. We should not reject nor dismiss their struggles as we aspire to be a better America. June's also National Immigrant Heritage Month. The promise of America is opportunity. It's that opportunity that afforded a Korean immigrant like myself to represent District 1, the largest Asian American and Korean American concentration in our city. It's also that American dream that allowed Fullerton resident and Lebanese American uh, Adele Hashkalil to ascend to the newly hired general manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the largest water utility in the country, which provides water to Fullerton residents and nearly 20 million others from Ventura all the way to the Mexican border. I'm honored to call him my friend and on behalf of Fullerton, I wish to congratulate him and wish him very great success in his leadership of MWD. And while we have much work ahead to truly achieve the promise of America, I for one am very grateful for our path forward and continued progress. Father's Day is Sunday. While we honor parenthood, we should also appreciate that study after study shows that children with involved fathers have stronger cognitive and motor skills, are more confident, 
curious, and empathetic, and enjoy elevated levels of mental and physical health. So thank you to all the fathers in our community who continue to raise the bar and inspire others. A note, another note about vaccinations, which I've spoken about more than there are Fast and Furious films at this point. Today uh, marks the full reopening of our state as we continue to transition out of this pandemic. Thankfully, COVID numbers across the board in the county, the state, and the nation are down and have been trending down for some time. But these optimistic figures paint a rosy picture because when the coronavirus numbers are adjusted for vaccination, they remain roughly the same as they were at the pandemic heights. Amongst the non-vaccinated, COVID rates of infection, of hospitalization, and of great risk of death are extraordinarily high still. So while it's important that we stay motivated and we stay vigilant, and urge all those in our community who have not received a shot to go ahead and do so. Vaccinations determine our economic recovery speed and our continued progress forward. So please keep the collective us in mind and get your $50 vaccination incentive. Finally, sir, June 25th marks the start of the Korean War, split a country and its people in two. 71 years later, it still remains divided. Nearly 40,000 Americans gave their lives in service during the Korean War but nearly two million Koreans perished in its three-year battle. Today, the two and a half mile wide demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel is one of the most heavily fortified and guarded places on earth. And while the questions of how it started and who's to blame are still hotly debated by officials in many countries, what shouldn't be is the primary goal of unifying Korea and its people once more. During my youth, my father championed reunification. He made it a cornerstone of his adult life, leading marches and rallies, writing countless articles in Korean newspapers on the subject matter. He may not see one Korea in his lifetime, but I certainly would appreciate seeing it in mine. But those are determinations that happen in the halls of power that I don't have the keys to. So I urge those in power this evening to remember the silent voices of the powerless and search for the common humanity in us all. Perhaps we should hope to be more like travels, travelers in our life and less like tourists. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Zara. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to, to say that as we are opening our economy and opening our state, that we, we do remain vigilant. Um, but also, uh, I'd like to remember all those who have lost their lives and uh, in our city and elsewhere. Um, they are in the thousands and in our nation hundreds of thousands. And so I hope that in, we can close our session tonight, Mr. Mayor, in memory of those who lost their lives. Thank you. Um, yes, Council Member Silva. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just uh, uh, want to wish everyone a uh, happy Father's Day, who's, you fathers out there. And uh, just again, uh, even though we are open for business in terms of the state, please be vigilant and please be careful. And uh, Let's make sure we don't uh, increase those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. You know, I have a few thoughts as I was not at the last meeting and unable to participate in the approval of the budget. But I wanted to share some concerns and really some frustrations related to the budget that was passed. Um, you know, the budget that was approved targets 2 to 5% cuts, which still leaves us with quite the deficit. And of course, as we know, that figure will compound. Had we been able to cut in a 7 to 10 percent range, we would have been on a path to progress. It would have actually gotten us somewhat out of the hole that we have been in and seem to continue to be in year after year. But I think what's, what's most interesting and what's most frustrating to me is that despite direction from council and countless meetings where we've heard community feedback, um, there were two critical items that were completely neglected in the budget. That, of course, being funding for the Museum Center that will be discussed later tonight, uh, and also including uh, something that's very near and dear to all Fullertonians, and that being road repairs. You know, there's not a dime uh, budgeted from the general fund uh, to fix our roads and streets, and that's something that we've heard about in study sessions, countless public comments, and I think every meeting that I've been, uh, been up here as a council member for during the past six months. And so clearly to that end, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. And, you know, I, I take it as a personal failure, really, that we were unable to get those items included into this budget. But that said, you know, it is concerning also that staff saw to it that a 5% pay reduction they had taken was, re was fully reinstated. 
Um, and so I have concerns with that because the reality is, as a council, you know, we are here as the voice of the people, and we need to make sure that we are spending the people's money on what the people want. I think the people have been very clear about some of those items, and you know, rest assured that we as a council will continue to work over the next year, uh, even as we work through this budget, to find the additional surplus funds to try to take these steps in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple items this evening. Um, a short while back, uh, since our last council meeting, I requested and received a tour of our uh, water utility, the Fullerton Water Department, uh, to be updated on w operations, on what's going on there. Uh, that was led by Meg McWait, our uh, Director of Public Works in the city. And as part of that tour, um, were the, was a tour of the Basque Yard offices and meeting with key and especially long-term employees. Uh, we do have the benefit of many uh, very experienced employees who have been with our water department for some time. One of the biggest challenges uh, has been the rate of water main breaks that we've had in recent years. I remember back, uh, I think it was 2012, the La Habra earthquake, where we had really numerous breaks, uh, water main breaks uh, at that time. And it's funny, it was called the, the La Habra earthquake. They, they had one water main break. I think we had 13. And so as water is increasingly more precious, uh, it's really important that we get a handle on that. We do have an aging uh, water delivery system, and that's being replaced as we go forward. But it will take some time to, uh, to do all the work necessary. We also toured the main pump field on La Palma Avenue in Anaheim. It's really nice of our neighbor to the south to host our primary source of water for the city of Fullerton. That's been long established. Uh, there is under construction there a new water treatment plant uh, where the water will be treated at the wellheads, uh, removing PFAS and PFOS, the contaminants now which the acceptable levels have been lowered to a few parts per trillion. And so this is moving along fairly well. I think the last estimate I saw, it's about 40% complete at this point. And so that's it pretty much on the waterfront right now. It will be a little less than three weeks, uh, and we will be celebrating the 4th of July. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, safety with both safe and sane fireworks, and then hopefully those who are utilizing illegal fireworks to be safe with those as well. Uh, often there's a, a misconception, the idea that we have safe and sane uh, actually creates use of illegal fireworks. Well, last year, during the lockdown, uh, that was called to be uh, very inaccurate because all throughout L.A. County, Los Angeles County, it was an amazing aerial show of Ill illegal fireworks uh, across so many cities that have never had and don't allow safe and sane fireworks. So our police and fire departments have a double challenge in this regard because they want to make sure and deal with any accidents that could occur with safe and sane, but to try to suppress uh, illegal fireworks, which are exceedingly dangerous. So I wish them well this year. I always do ask for a report afterwards in terms of what's happening. I'm happy to see that the penalties for illegal fireworks have been increased and that hopefully this can be a deterrent factor because it's impossible to cover every corner of the city at the same time. So thank you, gentlemen, for that. Uh, with that, uh, we are now at a uh, point for uh, appointments. And we have commission appointments to be made uh, to four different uh, advisory uh, commissions to uh, the city council. Uh, these would be all these appointments. What they're doing is expanding the membership of these commissions. And they would be for a period. It would, uh, their terms would expire December 31st of 2025. So we're about in the middle of this year. That's effectively about a three-and-a-half-year term for these eight selections. Now, a short while back, actually it's been a little while now, uh, Council Member uh, Fred Jung and I interviewed uh, all those who were available to speak on their behalf as to what they would bring to these commissions. 
And with that, we are making recommendations for these appointments to the rest of the council. The council may accept those recommendations or they may have a, a different idea on it. But uh, I will turn it over to Council Member Jung at this point to relate what our decision uh, making came to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor and Council. After extensive interviews with applicants for these four expanded committees and commissions, we have come to this uh, recommendation for the Active Transportation Committee, Mr. Mike Delgado, Dr. Alyssa Odipo, for the Investment Advisory Committee, Dr. James Cho, Mr. Jake Schreiber, for the Transportation and Circulation Commission, Mr. Quinton Jones, Mr. Martin Leslie, and finally for the Parks and Recreations Commission, Mr. Jensen Hallstrom and Ms. Angela Lindstrom. And with that, I would uh, make a motion, sir, to move these applicants forward and accept them on behalf of the council. Okay, I appreciate that motion. I would second that motion, but uh, I wanna open it up to council discussion on uh, whether to ratify these appointments or not. Just a question, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, d how many applicants did we get for each commission? Just, uh, do we know that? That's a great question, Mr. Park and Rec was the largest by yes. far. Okay. Yes. By far and away. Mm -hmm. There are about 10, if I'm remembering correctly, for Park and Rec off the top of my okay. head. And then the other committees had fewer. Sure. So there was interest in Park and Recs. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no comments on that. Um, yes, uh, I would invite public comments on this topic. And I'm seeing no takers yeah. at the moment. And I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, but we can get verification for that. There, there are no Zoom speakers. Okay. Great. Okay. So we'll bring it back to the council. We do have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll call for the roll. Council Member Jung? Aye. Council Member Silva? Yes. Council Member Zara? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap? And Mayor Whitaker. Aye. And the item passes unanimously. Great. Congratulations to those eight new members of the uh, commissions. We appreciate very much the volunteer of your time and your efforts and your expertise. And so I do want to congratulate all eight uh, uh, equally. But I do want to say as well that we appreciate the others who applied for these roles. Uh, there were many capable candidates. And we have a practice of keeping those applications on file unless those individuals decide to withdraw them. We do have vacancies from time to time and we do need that pool of applicants, uh, sometimes on short notice. So with that, Madam Clerk, is there anything further on that issue? No, I just have lots of phone calls and uh, work to do in the morning, but thank you for that. Great, thank you. Um, we're at the consent calendar now, and I haven't heard any items to be pulled this evening. Uh, so I'll move the consent calendar. I'll second. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd like to pull number item number five. Okay, item five, California Highway Patrol grant funds acceptance. Thank you, sir. And seeing nothing else, uh, we'll conduct a roll call on this. And this is everything on consent except item five, Council Member Jung. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Zara. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap. Aye. And Mayor Whitaker. Aye. Passes unanimously. And with that, Council Member Jung, unless you expect it to be really involved, could we handle that one item now? Certainly, um, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to pull this item because we've got a segment of our Fullertonians that always inquire about assistance with uh, drug education and anti-drug uh, funding. And I wanted to assure uh, that group of uh, young ladies that come to our council meetings that indeed this is a grant that uh, does just that, that uh, we have uh, constituents who have demanded action against these things. And we've allocated money through these grants to the necessary prevention of driving on the influence of drugs. I wanna reassure those in our public Action is being taken, oftentimes without much fanfare, but those items in government don't necessarily get many applause these days. Thank you, sir. 
Great, thank you. This was uh, submitted by our acting city manager, Steve Danley, and prepared by uh, Robert Dunn, our chief of police. Is there anything further that needs to be said on this item? All right, seeing none, would ask for public comment on this item. And uh, there seems to be no public comment. Any callers? There are no Zoom speakers. Okay. So with that, I'd entertain a motion. Motion's made, sir. Okay. Second. And seconded. And uh, with that, a roll call. Council Member Jung. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Zara. Aye. Rep. Tim Dunlop. Aye. And Mayor Whitaker. Aye. Passes unanimously. That brings us then to our first public hearing item this evening which is uh, and our only public hearing item. Uh, item number 11, appeal of conditional use permit denial, which is at 1600 North Acacia Avenue. I'll actually go first, then you. I go first, then you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Good evening, Mayor Whitaker, Heather Allen, the city's planning manager. As stated, uh, this item is appealed uh, of the Planning Commission denial of a conditional use permit for the property located at 1600 and North Acacia Avenue. Uh, this is an aerial of the site. It has two buildings. Uh, the easternmost building is the uh, temple um, as well as the uh, child care facility. The westernmost building is this two-story building that includes uh, private school and uh, administrative offices. Uh, the temple, uh, Temple Beth Tikva, uh, moved to the city in 1971 and has a history of maintaining a CUP since that time in the 70s. Uh, in the 2000s, the temple came um, before the Planning Commission requesting a CUP modification to update their operations, which included the expansion and construction of the two-story uh, uh, private school and administrative building um, on the western area of the property and most recently the CUP modification uh, that we're here to talk about this evening. So the specific request was to expand the private school use. The existing CUP covers the uh, primary use as a religious institution and accessory uses of a private school and a child care center. Uh, rece we received a request to modify the CUP to add a weekday private school for 15 children and 20 staff uh, for SAGE behavioral sciences that would occur in the uh, second floor of the two-story uh, office and school building. The uh, con uh, Planning Commission considered the request. Uh, they denied the request, and um, as afforded, the applicant um, has appealed uh, the request to the City Council. The uh, Municipal Code does provide a provision that when we receive a request for a use that uh, does not specifically fit a defined use, it does give us the ability to consider um, approving it as a use um, that would be consistent with how the requested use operates. So in this case, in looking at the operations of SAGE, um, they provide educational services, uh, they help with uh, students uh, who are, are fulfilling a special education curriculum. They uh, come to the site uh, either one in the morning or the afternoon. They're typically driven, dropped off, not inconsistent with the operation, operations of a private school. Uh, so we looked at uh, the provision provided by the municipal code, determined it consistent uh, with how a private school would operate. Uh, private school is a commercial use that it's permissible uh, within the residential zone with the conditional use permit and uh, specific operating standards for the private school use. So in reviewing um, both the provisions for a conditional use permit as well as the provisions for a private school, uh, we felt that uh, the proposed use was consistent and compatible. Um, so the city council is the reviewing body on the appeal. Um, so importantly, with the conditional use permit, we're looking at whether or not the use is compatible um, and has any impacts with the site or surroundings. So we look at the concurrently operating uh, uses that occur on the property. So by adding the uh, daytime private school use, it would operate concurrently with the daytime uh, child care facility. So when we look at what that looks at uh, in terms of parking, 
The concurrently operating uses would require 35 parking spaces on site. Uh, there are 85 across the property. So the peak use of this property is really their uh, religious assembly, which has a much larger use, taking uh, all 85 spaces. But importantly, um, that activity does not occur um, during the daytime when the child care use and the private school uh, would be operating. The nature of a conditional use permit also allows the operations, essentially the, the exhibit that you see on the screen would be an attachment to the conditional use permit. So at any time, if the church, the temple, the child care school, or the private school wanted to expand or operate diff differently beyond these hours, they would come back uh, to request a modification to the conditional use permit. Similarly, if they uh, did not operate within the approved hours, the uh, staff could bring the CUP back to the Planning Commission to consider adding additional conditions uh, all the way through a, a revocation proceeding. So the, the CUP does give us uh, quite quite an amount of control over, over um, the operations and any potential impacts that occur on the site and surroundings. So with that, uh, we have a resolution before you to uh, grant the appeal approving the conditional use permit modification. Uh, the resolution outlines the conditions of approval as well as the facts and findings of how this complies with both a private school use and a conditional use permit. Um, this project would be a categor categorically exempt um, under CEQA as an existing facility. Uh, we did provide for your use uh, an alternative resolution should you feel that you cannot make the findings and facts uh, to support the uh, CUP. So with that, I can answer any questions and the applicant and their um, their group is, is here as well. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. I have a question, uh, Ms. Al uh, Allen. Um, the, could you uh, just clarify the basis of which the Planning Commission rejected this uh, proposal? Certainly, I will. I will try. It was a, a not a unanimous decision. It was was three to two, and I think their general consensus consensus was that um, while a um, private school is one of the commercial uses that is specified in a residential zone with the CUP, I think they f those in opposition felt that this was more alike uh, to an office, a medical office, general office, or professional service, which would be a commercial use that is not. Um, approved in a residential zone with the CUP, so, more in a more uh, suitable for a commercial zone. So they did not base it on any traffic or parking Correct. issues. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have some questions along those lines too, but I think I'd want to hear from the public first. So appreciate your report. Anything else? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing on this item and invite public comment. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, since I'm presenting on behalf of the landowner, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if I could have slightly more than three minutes, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we do have to maintain that limit, so um, do your best. I'll do my best. Okay. Just just uh, like a commercial. Thank you. Fire it at us. Um, the, app, the landowner, TBT, has been using this site for over 50 years. During that 50 years, we've always used it for educational purposes. It includes beginning in 1976, uh, a child uh, preschool, which uh, is open to the public and has been open to the public uh, since it started, and in fact, we do have the public using it. This application relates only to the second floor of what is known as the Asa Center for Lifelong Jewish Learning. I emphasize lifelong learning. It has always been available and intended to be used for educational purposes. The reason we are here tonight is the temple is at a historic low in the intensity of the use of this property. We have had a reduction in our membership, as have most religious institutions at this time. If you follow that, that seems to be a historic trend. Uh, the child uh, preschool is at a low right now, uh, probably because of historic trends with respect to birth rates. In addition, for almost 10 years, beginning around 2010 until March of 2020, we also shared the space with another religious group, the Unitarian Universalist Church. They also used our premises, and we never had any complaints about traffic, overuse, or anything like that. They, after 10 years, 
left in March of 2010. As a result of this, the property is frankly not being utilized to its fullest extent. We then looked for a way we could productively use our property, and we found Sage Behavioral Services. Sage, as they will do, and they, they will do a little bit of a presentation here, their services are basically classroom services on a one-to-one -one basis. If you see their premises, they look just like a preschool. They look almost like ours down below, except the classrooms are a little bit smaller. The request is for 15 uh, students and 20 staff people since they're one-to-one. -one. That means that they would basically have one, the, the teachers there for the students during the day, plus a small if people need to be there to prepare something and for administration. Uh, the Planning Commission, as you asked, they didn't seem to have any problems with the traffic. We have letters. I, I, I don't know if you've seen them. I understand approximately 60 letters have been submitted to the council directly. Um, the very next door neighbor to the north of our property submitted one that says he's never seen any traffic impact. Thank you, sir. I will have to observe the limit, but perhaps if a council member has a question of you. I see none at this time, but uh, okay. thank you for your thank comments. You. Appreciate it. And anyone who would like to make a comment on this item, please line up on the wall. And whoever's closest can start with their comments. Hi, my name is Cindy Hebert, and I'm representing Sage Behavior Services, an agency that serves children with autism and other developmental disabilities. Sage was started in Fullerton in 2009, and we have continued to maintain our base of operations here ever since. We decided to open a clinic to offer a safe learning environment for children with disabilities. And while 90% of our students are served in the home or in the school settings, a clinic is an important option for working families to access services and for children who might not yet be ready for a traditional school setting. We operate just like most schools and child care centers. Parents drop off their children and pick them up a few hours later. Children learn specific skills from trained staff using research-based teaching strategies. Common activities include story time, art, music, calendar, structured work tasks, snack and lunch, toileting, and physical play. And we teach important life skills. Among many other things, we teach kids how to talk, how to make friends, and how to sit and follow directions. During the past year, we have also supported students with distance learning. Some of our students were taught the skills necessary for virtual learning and have been able to maintain their educational progress. In some instances, we have even had students thrive this past school year. This is all consistent with the use of the property for educational purposes. And we offer one additional benefit the neighbor, to the neighborhood that a traditional school can't offer. Because of the small number of children receiving services at the site, there is limited traffic at any given time. In fact, we are only requesting a CUP that allows for 15 kids and 20 staff, which is well below the average enrollment of any private school that would be there when the maximum occupancy is 201 people. We limit the number of students in each room, and this was always the case even before the pandemic. The assumption, assumption that we would grow and continually add kids to the facility if the CUP was approved is completely false and shows a gross misunderstanding of what we do the children we serve, as well as what the CUP would allow. Our needs and usage of the site is very different from the needs of any other commercial business in Fullerton, and we cannot be lumped into that general category. Most commercial businesses want to be in a location with lots of street and foot traffic and signage. We deliberately chose the most out-of-the-way place in Fullerton for our clinic rather than a busy commercial area for several reasons, and the first and foremost is the safety of the children. Many of the children with autism we work with have limited safety awareness and have a tendency to run in, out into busy streets and parking lots. We need to have a private parking lot with minimal number of cars coming and going. And secondly, like most schools, we do not allow the general public to enter the building and potentially interact with our students. We cannot share any part of the facility, with, especially the bathrooms, with the thank, public. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Elaine Asa, and if you heard the name of the building, it was actually named for my husband and myself. I have lived in Fullerton since, with my husband of blessed memory since 19, 
um, 66. I've raised my four children in this community. I've been a part of this community. I delivered my last child in this community. My husband was um, Rabbi Chaim Asa. He was a very active participant in this community. He was a part of so many projects. But I think one of his highlights, not just being the rabbi of the community for 30 years, was that he became the president of the Ministerial Association of Fullerton. And working with the Ministerial Association of Fullerton, he worked with Pathways of Hope to help with creating low-cost housing uh, in Fullerton. In all the years, and for me it's been 55 years, that I've lived in Fullerton and been a part of my community, there has never been a problem with traffic, with complaints, or anything. It's always been a really special relationship with the community of Fullerton. So I would hope that you would approve of what we are asking you to approve of. And I thank you for your time. And I think I made it before three minutes, thank which you. is very unusual for me. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Whitaker, Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap, and council members. I would like to speak on the appeal of conditional use permit denial of 1600 North Acacia Avenue. I am Jamil Urkia Holper, a resident and employee of Sage Behavior Services here in the city of Fullerton. As a behavior analyst and supervisor from Sage Behavior Services, I currently have two clients who are receiving services in our clinic located at the 1600 North Acacia Avenue. These two clients of Sage can receive between three to six hours of services in the clinic ranging from three to five days a week. During their time at the clinic, my clients have learned skills needed in the school setting, such as language, social skills, and structure. If the location of SAGE is removed, this will jeopardize the opportunities of my clients learning the skills needed in order to start school. Many families place their children in the clinic to provide the opportunity for them to have the similar experiences of a school schedule and environment to help them be better prepared. The clinic provides their children the opportunities to prepare them and help them thrive. To the families we serve, they consider these sessions as if their children are at school and are provided the opportunity to learn what is needed of them in school. Without the clinic, these families will not have the opportunity for their child to learn the crucial skills needed in order to start school. And I always think about what is going to happen if it got denied because a lot is going to be taken away from my clients. Uh, everyone else's, all the other children, as well as the family. To these families, the location of the clinic is convenient for them as they live near the area and it is central for many Orange County residents. Regarding to the proposed traffic, most supervisors, including myself, are working remotely and utilizing telehealth, which reduces the traffic in the area where the office is located. Most supervisors and staff are working in the client's home and in the school setting. There are limited staff and families coming in, and we have not seen any issue that were, be that were reported being caused by traffic or no noise complaints. This location does not cause any issue whatsoever to the neighborhood and would align with the standards of the schools that are located on the same street. Sadly, resources for children with special needs are limited in North Orange County, and SAGE provides the public with the option to help their children learn and thrive in an available and accessible location here in Fullerton. Losing SAGE would be a terrible disservice to the public and to the families raising a child with a disability in Fullerton and the surrounding areas. I have worked for this company for six years and have grown to love what I do, love the location, and learn to work with amazing children with special needs. Closing the location of SAGE would be a detriment to our families and the children we serve, as this decision would deprive them of the opportunities to learn and develop necessary skills. This decision by the council will place a heavy burden on SAGE's clients, families, and those associated with the services provided. I humbly request that you please take the following under consideration and vote in granting the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Whitaker, mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council members. I'm Joseph Hopper, a Fullerton resident, and I'm here to speak in support of SAGE Behavior Services. I firmly believe that the work being done by Sage Behavior Services at the current location 
truly meets the standards of what can be classified as a school or child care center services previously overlooked by the Planning Commission. With a lack of availability and accessibility for clinics serving children, removing SAGE from their current location will be a detrimental cause to many families struggling to receive services for their children. Many families place their children in the clinic to provide an opportunity for them to have a similar experience of a school schedule and an environment for them to learn. For the families they serve, the clinic would be considered as a child care and a school as their children spending anywhere from three to eight hours a day learning skills necessary to thrive and grow. Without the clinic, these families will not have the opportunity for their child to learn the crucial skills necessary in order to start school and will have to spend more time and money to find an alternative service clinic if available. Furthermore, removing this clinic from the location they currently reside will have an adverse effect on the children they serve and the families they are assisting each day. In regards to the proposed traffic and the parking concerns, I can attest as a husband to an employee of Sage Behavior Services that they have gone above and beyond in utilizing the access to telehealth and remote services to reduce traffic and disruption to the community and their center during this pandemic. Currently, over 90% of the children that they serve receive services at home or in school. With only 10% of SAGE children attending services at the clinic in order to supplement their educational value and focus on learning and to provide an important option to working families. Therefore, they would only have a small number of children at the clinic at any time and would not cause any disruption of traffic or noise previously addressed by the commission. As we celebrate the reopening of businesses this month, let us remember that this clinic never closed. They continued to serve their clients. In summary, this location does not cause any issues whatsoever to the neighborhood and would align with the standards of school and child care services required to remain at the location. With that, I request that you consider granting the appeal and allow Sage Behavior Services to remain at the location of 1600 North Acacia Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, my name is Dr. Roberta Landsman, and I live in Fullerton. I got a job teaching at Acacia in 1985, and I loved the city of Fullerton and the idea that this was a city of education. And with all of the schools, the colleges, everything about it was wonderful. We bought a home and moved in January 10th, 1988. And even to that point, I made my husband leave his office in Huntington Beach, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's at the Fullerton Towers that he's been there since that 1988 time. And it's interesting because um, Sharon Quirk Silva did her student teaching when I was at Acacia, and then she's in the same office building with my husband now, so it goes a long way. I was a school principal in the Orange Unified School District for almost 22 years. I trained principals and teachers. And when I know a lot about special education and the needs and equity and support for all children. And when Sage came here, I knew I was familiar with Autism Partnership. They both do the same. But this is an NPS, a non-public school. When I'm in a meeting and students have needs that the public school cannot meet, one of the placements would be at an NPS. These kids are on an IEP, an individual educational placement, and these are kids that are getting the education that I love to see when they would come to my school that they're coming with some kind of a school foundation. I hope that this continues. I, if I'm driving down Acacia, I always wonder, are they still there? I never see any cars in that upper parking lot at all. So I don't even know how traffic would even come to be in this. But it is important if we continue as an education city and be proud of that for Fullerton, that we meet the needs of all children, no matter what their background and what their special needs are. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Whitaker, 
Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Um, I'm a mother of a client at Sage. Um, my son is severely uh, autistic. He just turned six. Um, the reason why I'm talking to you today is I'm completely heartbroken that this is even at this point, that there's even an appeal for this. Um, this is our third clinic, and um, we had to shop around, and I can tell you that we have just been blown away by the staff and the level of just education and behavioral therapy and support that he is receiving. Um, the fact that we're even considering um, closing this down for the city of Fullerton um, is just so surprising to me. We actually should be opening up more places like Sage in our city. We need to help the community. We need to help the children that are out there struggling with these disabilities. There needs to be more places like Sage here, especially since we have Fullerton Cares, which is a great autism awareness organization here in the city of Fullerton. Um, I just really ask you to really consider because who's really going to be losing out, not only the staff and, um, you know, the people that work for SAGE that are absolutely amazing, but the families are going to be the ones receiving the brunt of this and then the children the most. Um, you know, my son um, has made the most gains while he's been at SAGE. Um, every time, and again, traffic, again, I don't even know what's up with that, but um, every time I ever pull into the parking lot, I feel like I'm the only one there. Um, I don't ever see any issues with that. Uh, Sage is great with communicating with the Fullerton School District. Um, the Fullerton School District will bus the students straight there after school if they're going to that district, and the students don't have any lapse of services at all, which seem to be, you know, an issue for us. Um, I've lived in Fullerton for over a decade, and we're looking to buy a new home, and we are not even considering leaving Fullerton because of SAGE. We love Fullerton School District, but we love SAGE more. And to be able to find a clinic that can house these, um, these children in a manner where we're going to see growth is very hard to come by. So please, I just ask you to please consider this. Please grant this appeal. Um, thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Carrie Castles. I'm going to try and do this without getting emotional, so bear with me. Um, I'm a resident of Fullerton. My son, Grant, I'm sorry. he's five years old and he's autistic. He has um, severe behaviors. And I thought my world was at an end in 2019 when I got the diagnosis. And it was a struggle to find in on-site services for my son. Um, I had to take time off of work. It was a struggle, it was loss of income. I was introduced to the wonderful team at SAGE and my, my world changed for the better. Um, my, my son, he is learning. He is getting ready to transition into kindergarten and they're working with him on classroom setting and following a schedule and helping him also, you know, learn calming strategies at the same time and as well as um, helping with his, you know, just activities of daily living at the same time. And I tell you, you know, the first couple weeks at Sage, you know, with, with children with autism, any kind of change, any kind of disruption in their routine is very devastating to them. And when we found Sage, it did take him a couple weeks to adjust to the team. And since he's adjusted, he's been there since March of 2020. And despite even with the COVID challenges of, you know, having to, you know, keep him there and they worked with us. And I work full time and so does my husband. We work um, both in Fullerton. And there is no other location nearby so that I can continue to work full time. Um, lo the location of Sage is a big campus. It's a nice, safe neighborhood and safe um, parking lot. My son runs away from me. He takes off. And when he does that, I'm able to grab him in enough time before he gets to the street. Um, so it's so important to have that location where Sage is right now. Um, so I just would really like you to please consider um, what this will do for myself, my son, it will be um, very traumatic for him if I have to find another services for my son. He would have to start over when he's made so much progress. 
Um, and I'm so excited for him to be starting kindergarten in the fall with the help of the team of Sage. And I can't say it enough. They're like family. And he has learned so much and he's growing and he's so happy. And that's all thanks to Sage. So please, please um, consider to keep the location. I thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Christina Adami, and I am a parent of a child that's at SAGE. My son is, um, has nonverbal autism. He's been with SAGE since he was 20 months old. He started with zero social skills, zero play skills, and absolutely no communication. He is now four, active, and has a huge personality. He is communicating in sentences on an AAC device. He has thrived at SAGE. This location has been just an amazing blessing to our family. He is learning how to get ready for school. SAGE, the setting, has allowed him to actually start school this summer, so now he goes from school to SAGE. And I just ask that you vote in favor of this appeal because the SAGE, it would just be a detriment to my child, to all the parents with special needs, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hello. My family has lived in Acacia since 2011 and in this neighborhood since 2000. I've had the opportunity to talk with and collect signatures of every nearby neighbor in the immediate temple area. Most of them are elderly and unable to attend, but they were involved in the 2005 and other uh, meetings. Every one of them has asked, and I have the signatures here, that the commission appeal, uh, that the commission abide by the original 421A and B um, cup and deny any changes. Another 60 signatures online of Acacia families also request the same. A bit of the timeline here is when 2005, the temple proposed the building for member religious education classes and parents. That was the approval, specifically that they could use it for that use only and rent, rent or occasionally sublet for community and other member activities. This required permission for any changes. The commissioner st stressed that if there were three verifiable complaints, this would revolt, result in a review of the CUP. And there are more than 10 of them out there right now since the beginning of 2020. You forward to 2019, and the temple advertised the entire building, 13,000 square feet for lease, on commercial websites. November, December of 2019, they moved any of the community and member activities down out of the building. And in January 2020, Sage came to the City Hall asking only for a sign permit. No changes in the permit. In February, the Planning Department was, a, was apprised of the situation, a large business operating with what you saw on the Google Street Maps, many, many cars, many employees, maybe 20 per day, but uh, that at 20 at particular hour, but it can be many, many more. This is a school dense R120 neighborhood. Okay, this is in direct violation of the 421A CUP, all residential zoning, business licensing, and other regulations. And it took 10 months, not until October 2020, with all the violations out there, did anyone from Sage or the Temple come to the city to talk about changing this conditional use permit? CUP 421 never refers to a private school. I've checked the records. I've looked at the detail from the temple members, from everything else. It refers to religious education, member classes, after school. Not a 50-hour per week business entity moving in where a church or a temple was. That's a two or three hour, one day a week thing. This is every day of the week. And this is not like a, a school where there's a set early morning, and an evening or an afternoon let out. We jumped quickly from the member RE classes to a private school and now to a school like business. Thank you for your comments. All right. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, as my wife said, we live here in the neighborhood for 20 years now. Um, but we're here because the applicant did follow the mantra it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Um, 
They also want to state that there's no undue burden for the applicant. A commercial business that is seeking a variance to operate in a residential zone building since it had a prior appropriate office space in Fullerton but voluntarily decided to move in violation of zoning rules and existing CUP. Nor is it for the propri a property owner. On the other hand, there will be significant undue burden to the immediate neighborhood and extended neighbors. There will be no more room for community offerings such as Weight Watchers, ceramics classes, or com summer camps. I even think the signage has been removed for the lifelong learning from the building, which I think is a shame. I um, also think that if we sh deviate from clear um, rules that do not allow a commercial business to operate in a residential zone building, the city will be having to fight many more applicants um, for that. And so I think it's a slippery slope that I think the city should stay away from. Um, Acacia is a dangerous road. Um, and additional traffic during school hours, uh, location of the property with blind driveways over a hill cusp, and the excessive speed and excessive parking to business operations are real concerns. We have seen 10 to 20 cars parked on the street. If you Google map the location, you actually find the pictures. There's no explanation why this would not return in the pandemic ends if, we, if you approve that CUP modification. Um, other concerns that are not addressed by the, public, uh, by the city of the applicant is um, I feel the city would be potentially significantly liable for any accidents that happens for people going or related to that unsuitable use of a commercial business in a residential neighborhood. Just want to remind the city council about the accident with fatality on Acacia and um, I think it's Kimberly, right? Um, cost a, com uh, the, a lot of money and I don't want the city to incur that again, this liability. Um, where are there any enforceable limits of the exaction of the current permit? I have not read, seen anything. There are no additional changes. Are there any additional changes required if it's now considered a school? Um, I think when the first CUP was discussed, there were questions about a fence or block wall that would be required. We don't know this. Um, where is speed mitigation? Make the applicant certify that they comply with it regularly. And what are the penalties? This is not a complete list. I think it's going to be it's being crammed down our throat. Um, in closing, I would like to the city council to reject this. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate sir. it. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa Cabrera, and unfortunately, I am not a Fullerton resident, but I live in a neighboring city, and I've had the honor of serving many Fullerton families uh, for, for nearly 11 years at SAGE um, across our many locations in Fullerton. I just want to say thank you, first and foremost, for honoring our time together and for everyone's support of this process. It's amazing to see how many people have turned out in support of SAGE and the families and the children that we serve. I have a simple question, and it is a little bit more of a rhetorical question, although I, I might have just had that answered. Um, who, who is in favor of, of seeing children succeed? Um, <laughs> I think I would be hard-pressed to try and find one, maybe two, um, individuals that don't support helping our most vulnerable population. In fact, success starts in childhood, and the services that we provide set their children off on a fabulous start to be successful well into their teenage and adult years. We need to be able to provide a reliable environment for the children that we serve to thrive in. As you've heard from our families that we've had the honor of serving, those reliable environments and that consistency is key in their children's success, their lasting success. <sighs> Because of the reliable environment we're able to provide, we're able to support communication skills, self-care skills, we're able to work on social skills, so many different skills that, again, set a foundation for, for the rest of their lives. I just have a very difficult time trying to understand why we're being presented with, with this situation um, being told that this reliable environment that is supporting children 
with a variety of different needs. Um, it's at risk of being shut down and our doors closed. If our learning center is required to, clo to close and relocate, the children that we serve will experience a disruption to their success stories. And again, we're doing this for the children. That's why we're here. And that's why I know every single one of our SAGE staff in the background or in the back of this room is here to support the children and their families. They're going to lose critical opportunities to grow and learn. Um, and these opportunities have already been disrupted by this pandemic. And I just have a really hard time understanding having to put the children and our families through that again. So pl have a great evening. Thank you so much. You. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Cheryl Sider, and my husband and I have been Fullerton residents for almost 20 years. Our eight-year-old son, Nolan, who has autism, was adopted at birth and has been a resident of Fullerton his entire life. I am here to be the voice for Nolan. I am here to preserve hope and allow grace and dignity for children with autism to aspire to a life of independence by ascertaining life skills and social skills with the partnership of Sage Behavior Services. Sage Behavior Services has provided assistance with Nolan for pro approximately four years. When Nolan started at Sage, my husband and I, like many parents who have a newly diagnosed child with autism, felt scared, marginalized, isolated, and hopeless. With the help of SAGE, Nolan became capable of so much more than his diagnosis. As a result of working with SAGE, Nolan is now attending summer school in a general education class at Beechwood Elementary. Life skills that neurotypical children perform automatically are challenging for Nolan. SAGE staff introduces concepts to Nolan in a way that is not only attainable to master, but to inspire growth. Nolan began to thrive when attending SAGE versus our home, and the data proves his success. Reading a fellow neighbor's social media posts filled with intolerance and gaslighting assumptions was incomprehensible. Keep in mind that SAGE is providing much of the same services, services that the neighboring preschool provides, but to developmentally, developmentally de delayed children. And to answer the ill-informed, um, SAGE has never told us to park in another parking area. People are not being asked to change class locations. Staggered drop-off times and Zoom began as a result of COVID precautions. The city of Fullerton has been a longtime ally to the autism community. Cal State Fullerton boasts the Center for Autism. The annual Mardi Gras for Autism is an event that draws attendance from all over Southern California. Fullerton Cares Autism Foundation, the annual comedy show for autism at the historic Fox Theater, and CF Dance Academy's Everybody Dance Now are some examples of how the city of Fullerton is known as a supporter to the autism community at large. Fullerton promotes inclusivity, and I am proud to be a resident of a city that promotes autism acceptance. SAGE is helping raise future Fullerton citizens. Our children already have so many obstacles to face. Please do not take away this opportunity to help them navigate their way through life. Right now, SAGE is the largest piece of the autism puzzle to develop life skills such as using utensils to eat or responding appropriately to a question like, how are you doing today? The work that SAGE is doing with my son transcends, transcends the work that we were doing at home and is creating change that affects our community's future. It is already challenging enough to access services for those with autism. Please do not throw a challenging um, roadblock, which in turn is a roadblock for opportunities with dignity. Nolan's time spent at SAGE is a testament to his growth and success. Please continue to allow those with autism to receive classes, be an advocate for their unheard voices, and promote living with inclusivity. Please acknowledge that every mind matters. Thank you. How are you, Doug Wisman? I live in Fullerton. Um, I've lived all over the South. Um, my children were born in Savannah, Georgia. Um, we've, I've walked, I work around the, the country working on military bases. Um, we happened to be in Oklahoma when we got diagnosis of our, we have nine-year-old triplets. Two of them have autism, one severe and one not, one somewhat mild. Um, we happened to run into somebody in Oklahoma. There's, their services are very subpar for those very subpar our services, you pay about $4,000 a month, and you make about half what you would make here at a very good job. So moving to, uh, we met someone at the facility who had lived in Fullerton and gone to Cal State Fullerton, and um, she told us that we should move to Fullerton, California, that they have very good services. She had also known about uh, SAGE and said we should, we should call them, contact them. So we moved here for my children. Um, they both attend Fullerton schools. This would not have been possible without the SAGE program, and 
and getting them ready for school. If there's a question of this, if, if is this a school? My son spent all his preschool and all his kindergarten 40 hours a week at Sage so he could go to the first grade and be a, a productive student. Um, I speak, I'll speak pretty plain. Um, all the traffic, all this, that, that's all garbage. These people are, are obviously going to say whatever they can say to try to get this change. That's fine. Uh, I deal with liars. I deal with charlatans all the time. Okay? These people just making stuff up. The truth of all this is they don't like seeing handicapped people. Okay? That's, what, that's what's not going to come out here is these people don't want to see our children on their street. There's nobody parked on their street. There's nobody. All that's BS, okay? These people don't like seeing handicapped people. They're the people that I see at Red Robin that laugh and go, oh, God, here they come. These are who these people are, right? They're disgusting. This is ridiculous. The fact that these people, we should throw these type of people out of this town. This is, this is ridiculous. This is all over because they don't want to see our children. You've seen moms come in here cry tonight. My wife's watching this right now, crying at home. These women all cry all the time. I cry. This is hard, okay? These same people that just said this, they're going to need services when they're old, right? And if somebody comes to them, and these people have dementia, and somebody's helping them, and they take their services away, I'm not a hard-hearted person. But I could go along with that, that these people don't deserve any services from this city. They don't deserve any of this stuff. They're liars. They make this stuff up, and I'm, I've, I've had it. This is stupid. We moved here for this. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. I'm Cindy Jacobson. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a current member of Temple Beth Tikva's executive board a past president and a member for over 25 years, and I also am asking for your support. I've been rather stunned by the complaints of a few neighbors. I think these complaints contain grossly distorted numbers of staff and students in traffic for SAGE. Uh, basically, these co complaints ignore the fact that our campus is now being used so much less than it's been used in the decades that we've been there with a very active campus. Uh, in 2019, when the Unitarians outgrew our facility and planned to move out, and with our member numbers and donations decreasing, we needed to find a new tenant. We had excess space, and we had demands uh, for our budget that we really were struggling. We looked at tenants, and we found SAGE. SAGE, we believed, was a phenomenal match for the community, they're quiet, they're respectful, they don't use the space intensely, and they also share our common goals of helping to make the world better because that is what Judaism is about, our mission, is to try to make the community better and to try and bring spiritual healing. And these people at SAGE bring healing to the community. I will say that in the beginning, we still had the Unitarians there. We had Sage. They were showing some open houses. And the neighbors may have seen some excess traffic for a few months during this overlap. overlap. And those are the months they're referring to. But I'll tell you, I've reached out to those neighbors. We sent multiple letters. We said, come and let's talk. Come and let's show you what it is. And they refused to answer. And now they've done study after study of traffic, and there just isn't any. And I, I just wish they would be more understanding. We've tried to be really good neighbors and tried to reach out. And SAGE is such an important part of Fullerton community, and so is Temple Bat Tikva. And we all want to be good neighbors. We want to be part of this community and make it a better place. And I hope you can see that and help support us. And the last thing I would like to say is... If TBT is unable to rent the ASA Center to SAGE because of some very narrow definition of what an education is, what a school is, we're going to have trouble finding another tenant that's going to fit this narrow definition. And a lot of other churches are going to have these problems too. Religious attendance is down. We've got excess space and, and donations are down. We, 
how are we going to stay there? How are any of these places going to continue? So thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I see no further speakers. Uh, do we have Zoom commenters? We have one. Okay. We have one. Galaxy S20, please unmute. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. I, I apologize, I couldn't change my name uh, in, the, in my cell phone. My name is Rabbi Niko Sokolovsky. I'm the rabbi of Temple Beth Tigba. So I wanted to, to share a few words first. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, I, I, can you hear me well? Can you see me? Hello? We can hear you. You can hear me. So I just wanted to emphasize that we are talking about values. We are not just talking about words, right? Is it a school or a business? We are talking about the value of education. These people work in education. We are talking about values, and therefore, Temple of Estigma has four core values. Spirituality, wisdom, community, and tikkun Sage helps us fulfill our mission, our mission of serving the community, of connecting with the community, of increasing life in our community, and also the mission of making this world a better place, of doing tikkun olam, of rectifying the many things that are wrong in our world. And one of them is our educational system, and Sage helped us make our educational system better. There's no doubt. So I hope that we can connect with these values and that we can get past the challenges that the vocabulary is presenting to us and, and internalize the fact that Sage is certainly a blessing for Temple of Tigba because it, it was just the perfect partner. We wouldn't rent our property to anyone. And we were very lucky to find this partner and we are very grateful because once again, this partner helped us fulfill our mission of serving and connecting with our community and bringing well-being to the world, number one. But this, this organization also brings blessing to many, many families in our city and in our county. And it brings blessing to the entire city. So I hope that the city can recognize that and can uh, embrace SAGE for what it is and is an educational organization that is helping us make our community a better place. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your comments. Sherry Chapman, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi there. Um, I wrote a letter today and I didn't attend because I'm a very emotional person. I didn't want to blubber in front of everybody. But I live around the corner from Rosary. I hear these kids at 6 a.m. screaming and yelling in my bedroom window, waking me up. But I am thrilled that there are kids that are really decent and good going to school. I don't care. Let them do whatever they need to do to get a wonderful education. I have gone up to the temple many times. I've seen the young parents sending their children to our preschool. Luckily, those are normal kids attending the preschool. I have never met one parent who said, why are we having behavioral kid problems um, in a school so close to our school? Never. There has never been an issue with autistic kids. You know, you walk in somebody else's shoes and you see these parents are wonderful, are trying to do something with their children. And if we can provide that for them, I am so thrilled to see that they will be lifelong members of Fullerton. So that's basically what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more Zoom speakers. 
Okay, with that, I'll bring the discussion back to the council. We will close the public hearing. And uh, let's go all the way to the end. Uh, council Member Silva, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And I had the opportunity to, to visit SAGE, and uh, I myself am a, a junior high school teacher, and at my school we have a, a, um, a pretty big bro program for uh, 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 disadvantaged kids uh, and uh, mild to severe. And what I see in our school when they do the outreach with the kids one-to-one -one or in small groups is exactly what's going on at SAGE. I understand that maybe that the, the, we were having trouble with the definition, but from what I saw at, at the at the facility, uh, their teachers there are teaching to these students who otherwise uh, would not be able to get the services. So, for that reason, I I would uh, like to uh, move the the recommended action and, and adopt the the resolution, Mr. Uh, Mayor. I would second that. Council Member Jung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, I spoke with or met all of the uh, stakeholders on this issue, and I stand with my planning commissioner, uh, Jose Trinidad Castaneda, uh, who voted in favor of this uh, conditional use permit. Conditional use permits are not set in stone. Oftentimes they're fluid for a reason because change is the one constant. As a city, we often amend uh, these CUPs and our ordinances to offer uh, an example would be offering uh, outdoor dining. We closed uh, alleyways and a street to support small business restaurants during the pandemic. It's important to me that we uh, preserve quality of life in our city. That quality of life not only speaks to limited traffic impact, but just as important is supporting our Jewish community who attends the temple and the parents and children who attend Sage School. School's footprint, as far as I can see, is limited. It not virtually non-existent, seems like a sky is falling approach by a neighbor who is perhaps uninformed or ill-informed. Sage is uh, paying more than their fair share to be there and be part of this community. Moreover, the temple could not fiscally function without its Sage partners, as they reiterated this evening. I want to remind those in our community that rights for groups in need like children in our faith community does not mean less rights for you. It's not pie. So uh, I look forward to the vote, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Um, sure, Council thank, Member Zara. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I will echo my uh, um, Council colleagues' uh, thoughts, and I appreciate everybody who, who came out and uh, spoke uh, on, and, and often these are um, concerns, everybody has their concerns. Uh, there is the technical issue here, which is the definition um, that the Planning Commission um, um, looked at. Um, I think our uh, code needs to be redefined and we need to accommodate and I hope that we can look into that so that we don't have and clarify the definition of school so that this doesn't come up um, in the future again uh, and then expand that so to include uh, special uh, um, schools like this as well. Um, I think I did visit and all I saw was uh, kids wonderful kids. I got to meet a couple of them. Uh, they're just lovely kids who uh, were receiving education, were being taught, um, and uh, the, the teachers were wonderful. And I didn't see anything other than that. Uh, there was no parking issues, no traffic. Uh, I stayed there for about an hour. Uh, and, um, and if we are to be a, a city of education, uh, we need to support the education of everybody uh, and every kid. And, uh, and so uh, this is uh, not only um, our imperative as a, as a community, but it is the right thing to do morally as well. And, uh, and again, in the spirit of Takun Alam, um, I, will, I seconded the motion. Thank you. Do you want to go sure. next or last? Yeah. Okay. No, that's sure. – you know, I, 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 look, um, I, I'm supportive of the appeal as well. Uh, but I would just like to add, I think, you know, the testimony that we saw this evening, I, I have found to be very compelling. And I always enjoy hearing the historical details and accounts of, you know, people and how they started their, you know, their lives here in Fullerton and how they've raised families or they've, they've had other important experiences. And I think it's just great to see 
just how this, you know, the, the relationship with Sage here at, at the temple is going to positively affect, I think, so many in the community, um, you know, through the educational services that are provided. Um, you know, while you never want to dismiss uh, any concerns or complaints that a, that a neighbor might have, uh, I found that many of the comments or suggestions I received sort of miss referred to or, or were, you know, misguided in this case. You know, for example, it seemed that some were hung up on the idea that this was a large commercial enterprise uh, and that it was allowing businesses into a residential neighborhood. But the reality is, under the code, that is allowed. And in fact, between the educational or child, child care facilities, um, you know, I, I couldn't think of something that's more in line with that than perhaps the SAGE, you know, SAGE services. I think what's even more, I think, um, you know, compelling, at least in my experience, uh, over 20 years of, of kind of living in that neighborhood and, um, you know, also looking at the history, 20 years of no complaints, in my personal experience, I think, bolsters that reality. And so uh, I, I support the appeal as well and have no further comments. Thank you. I, I look at this and uh, understand that uh, our planning commission was concerned about those, as was mentioned here prior, some of the uh, definitions, uh, terminology, whether or not a technical adjustment needs to be made on this, because I see all of you people who have been put through this because of the denial at the Planning Commission. And I don't think most of it is based on uh, parking or, or crowding of any sort on the streets or disruptions. I really don't think that's primarily what the Planning Commission landed on this. I, I do, what I'd like to do at least is recommend, uh, I, I'm a longtime supporter of Fullerton Cares, and they do fundraising for autism-related services at local public schools. And I'm very familiar with parents of autistic children or some with behavioral issues as well. Uh, and there is a need for these types of services, but it seems like somewhere in the discussion this got um, fogged over a little bit by whether it's medical or educational or social services that's happening there. Um, I think that uh, what I'd like to do at least is recommend uh, the maker of the motion, uh, <coughs> Council Member Silva, I, I certainly would not like to see uh, this facility closed down because of a technical problem. But what I'd like to see is maybe a temporary, maybe 120 days or something, till we can get our definitions and the technical problems out of this. Because I'd hate to see anyone else put through this process uh, that, that many of you have endured this evening. And I, I was going to ask uh, Miss Allen whether she concurred with the idea that there might be impre imprecise definitions or terms like school-like. I know there was some concern that school-like could be expanded to mean almost anything. Is that? Sure, certainly. So I think the, the um, I guess I would answer that a couple ways. The municipal code does allow interpretations to be made. So I think to the comment of um, looking to expand the definition of school, I think, is, um, is helpful. Um, I think that um, can be a, an action separate and apart from this. I think you have, um, you do not have to say this is a private school. You can say this is like a private school and make the findings for a CUP. That's well within the um, municipal code as it stands today. So I, I think, um, I think to your concern, we can definitely address the definition, but I don't, I would not think that that would need to hold up an action on the CUP. I would also just add as a educational tool, the more information we get as part of an application to clearly define what the use is, is always helpful too. I think a lot of the information that came out tonight um, would have been helpful even earlier in the process. So for other applicants out there in in uh, in uh, the city, I would encourage more, more, more information the better. Um, sooner in the process, but we can certainly amend our, our definitions as well. Well, I only bring up a temporary extension for the idea of providing some impetus to make sure that we do that because there are so many things the old around to it, and if we don't get to it, whether or not this can be challenged and whether or not someone could be put through the ringer again. So I would like at least some reassurance that that will indeed happen and within a prescribed time period. 
Certainly. Well, I would think that um, I, the the process to amend the ordinance can start with a notice of intent uh, from either the planning commission or the council. I think it sounds like there's direction to staff to bring the notice of intent back. Um, we can bring it either to the council or the planning commission. Um, it is, does not require public hearing for the notice, so we can certainly start that process. Okay, uh, I, I would be comforted by that because there's, you know, I haven't found anything highly objectionable to uh, this facility. It's really uh, very unique. It has uh, park-like views from the inside. It is fairly insulated, and uh, and I know that the uh, the population there, all uh, children from preschool to about uh, grades four or five, uh, for the most part. Uh, and that uh, the peak uh, attendance there would be maybe 16 at any given time. So, um, yeah, as, as long as I, I want to be very supportive of this, but I do want to solve any underlying problem that could lead even a future planning commission astray, right? Certainly. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, would there be a way for us to do that so that we can give the, uh, the applicant some certainty here this evening so that we could perhaps continue with the motion as a pr or the motion as made and then separately provide that direction would that uh, I'm okay with that although sometimes direction doesn't get followed uh, from the council as I think you're aware of as well uh, uh, as, um, as, sure. as staff I can tell you that y we hear you very very clearly and we will fo follow through all right well certainly I want to be able to vote in the affirmative could have the microphone uh, to vote in the affirmative on that, so I'll take I'll take that as uh, assurance. All right. And with that, is there anything further from the council? Nope. Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, we could uh, take a roll call okay. vote. Council Member Jung. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Zara. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap. Aye. And Mayor Whitaker. Aye. And this Most is the resolution to. This is the resolution to approve the appeal. And with that, Mr. Mayor, if we can take a five-minute recess, that'd be great. Good suggestion. We'll do that. Five-minute break. I guess we can make five minutes last for quite a while. Um, so with that, we will... Uh, Resume the meeting with uh, agenda item number 12, which is a request for city support from the Fullerton Museum Center Association. Uh, this item prepared by Krista Johnson, Interim Deputy City Manager. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Krista Johnson, your Interim Deputy City Manager. One of the hats I wear here is as the Acting Parks and Recreation Director. Also here with us tonight is Acting Parks and Rec Deputy Director Alice Loya, Janet uh, Buzan, President of the Fullerton Museum Center Association, is in attendance tonight with several uh, board members and um, uh, museum supporters. Uh, the item before you tonight concerns the operation of the Fullerton Museum Center. I'm going to keep my introduction of this item brief. I just want to provide a little bit of background for you and the folks watching from home. Uh, recent background, so the museum was uh, closed in March 2020 in response to the COVID-19 quarantine and the um, governor's um, health orders. Due to the quarantine and the city's budget deficit, Parks and Recreation Department um, canceled many of its programs, uh, closed uh, many of its facilities, and reduced staffing. Uh, the mu museum was identified as a reduction due to the amount of annual general fund support of over $600,000 for management, staffing, maintenance, and operations of the building. To continue providing community programs, staff began seeking partners for its closed facilities, including approaching the FMCA to take over the museum operations. Um, in the City Council gave direction just this past February 2020 for staff to assist the FMCA with the reopening of the museum for three days a week, Thursday through Saturday time, time frame to uh, by April 25th of 2021. Uh, in response, the FMCA um, indicated that it was not ready to, do, to reopen the museum by that date, and they requested time to create a transition plan 
to inventory its collection, its gift shop, evaluate beer garden operations, plan the first exhibit, and create an operating and funding plan to reopen. So they worked very hard. They sent um, correspondence to the city council on April 27th. Um, providing information and requesting council's policy direction regarding funding and next steps for the museum. So how has the museum been operated and funded? Uh, the city has been financially responsible for all staffing, management, operations, and maintenance of the museum. So in effect, the city has been responsible for the museum as a function of its recreation and parks department. Uh, this costs the city uh, approximately $600,000 a year. The FMCA has been responsible for selecting and funding the exhibits and educational costs above what the city provides in funding. And they do this through um, extensive fundraising. They are able to um, fundraise uh, approximately $160,000 um, each year. Their uh, fundraising efforts include museum memberships, um, proceeds from their gift shop, and the beer garden uh, at the Thursday market. And these fundraising efforts are supported by city staff. For example, the beer garden and the gift shop were managed and staffed by city employees. So it's been a, 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 good, a good partnership over the years. Uh, the, so the total cost to operate the museum is approximately 760000 600 from the city, 160 from the FMCA. Uh, staff did complete over these past couple of weeks research into municipal funding and operation of local museums, and that information was included in your agenda report for this item. So going forward, um, on April 27th via their letter, the F FMCA is requesting financial support from the city in order to reopen the museum for a minimum of three days a week. Uh, their request and a couple of options that we came up as staff for the city council to consider this evening. And these are listed into your in your agenda report. I'll just go over them very briefly. So the first is maintain the status quo. And that would be, unfortunately, keep the museum closed because that is the status quo for the upcoming fiscal year 21-22. This is the option that is reflected in the uh, the budget that was adopted by the city council on, on June 1st. Um, even when keeping the museum closed, there are still costs involved, approximately $156,000 in city costs to maintain the building, uh, provide for uh, limited utilities, and, and insure it. Uh, the option B is the previous model, model meaning pre-COVID. So the city would continue to operate the museum in partnership with the FMCA and the general fund uh, to a, co a cost to the general fund of, of about $600,000 um, annually. Um, minimal savings could be achieved by reducing the operation uh, to three days a week. Uh, the third option is, is for the city to provide a grant to the FMCA um, per one of the options in their April 27th correspondence. Um, if the city were to provide a uh, $205,000 grant to the FMCA to operate the museum, and then the city already has in its budget $113,000 for utilities, custodial services, and building maintenance. So the estimated um, that in that option, you provide the grant of 205000 to the museum. The city provides what it already has in its budget for total city funding of $320,000. Um, this would uh, provide the FMCA with a grant that would pay for a, um, a full-time uh, director, uh, FMCA part-time staff, and other operation costs. So in this option, there would be no uh, city staff that would be provided for this function. Uh, the last um, option is some other level of grant funding that uh, is determined by the city council. And then the FMCA would uh, decide if they can operate the museum with that amount of funding from the city and, of course, with their own, their own funds um, and what level of, of uh, operation that would provide for. Uh, no city staff would be um, involved in this option either. So 
options B, C, and D uh, require additional funds to what is included in the city's adopted budget for the coming fiscal year. If the city decides, if the city council decides on one of these options, then um, the city council um, would need to provide direction on how to fund it. Uh, staff did provide several options uh, for reductions in the Park and Recreation Department's um, current budget. And those options are identified in the agenda report, and I'm happy to go over them um, again if, you, if you'd if you like to, me to do so. Um, and then lastly, staff is recommending that the City Council grant the FMCA's uh, request for a one-time reimbursement of its expenses that were incurred during the COVID pandemic. Uh, you may recall that in an agenda report that was provided to Council just this past March 16th, uh, there was also a request in that report uh, for this uh, one-time reimbursement. Um, and these were for expenses of $51,770 for non-refundable exhibit deposits and guitar shipping fees that were incurred when the museum had to close down to the state shelter-in-place order. Um, unfortunately, the FMCA's attorneys uh, were not able to um, uh, uh, get the penalties reversed, um, and funding for this reimbursement would come from the current fiscal year's uh, Parks and Recreation Department um, budget. So in conclusion, staff is asking the City Council to provide direction on the following. Number one, consider the FMCA's request for a grant to manage and operate the museum and provide direction to staff on to the amount of a grant and the funding source. Two, if the council decides to provide a grant to the FMCA or continue to operate the uh, museum as a city function, then um, approve any necessary budget amount amounts in the amount of the grant um, and the funding source to be determined by the council. And then three, to authorize that one-time reimbursement of $51,000 um, to the FMCA. That's what I have for you this evening in my presentation, but we are available for um, questions. Any questions by council at this stage? Council Member Jung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor and Council. I had, uh, we have appointed a council liaison to the museum. By, per his uh, request, I'd like to get an update on where uh, if he was able to establish any funding. It was one of the reasons why he wanted to be appointed, his expertise in that matter. So could, if we can get an update, sir, I'd certainly appreciate that. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll start. I, I, the update is, as the presentation, um, it is my opinion that this museum cannot function without city subsidy at this point. Um, if we do not, the, the capacity um, that they have is not adequate enough at this point for um, putting together a long-term plan in such a short notice. And so that, that is uh, the interaction. There's also some physical uh, needs uh, that, um, such as putting up uh, exhibits that are very heavy, um, and there is a need for um, also ne looking at some of the issues within the contracts that we have with them uh, that limits their ability to hire directly employees as well. So those are some of the big the big uh, issues here. Um, if uh, I think it, it is my conclusion that this city council needs to decide whether they want to be in the business of art or not. This is the decision tonight, because if we decide that we do want this, then, then we need to figure out how to fund it on the short term. Um, and I know this is going to be a very tough thing because we are short on every, in every single department. Um, and uh, so this is the determination that we need to make today. But my, my, my um, conclusion from the uh, interactions that we've had and the discussions that we've had is that uh, without, on the short term, without subsidy at this point, uh, we are dooming this museum. So is it, does that mean you've been unex unsuccessful in terms of finding funding? It is my, not my job to find funding. That was one of the things that 
you said qualified you for that liaison position, no? I've only been there on it for three, <laughs> three, three meetings, sir. Uh, I don't. So that's a no. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> any any other comments at this time before we were? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like comments? to make comment. I I think we need to look at. Um, we need to be productive and not look at ways of digging at each other because this is not how we, we're not supposed to be doing this. Uh, we need to look at um, practical ways to serving our community. And, and this is a, a decision and a promise that has been made by this council uh, with big promises made for not just the museum but about every single thing that we can fix everything. I appreciate um, so. those sentiments, especially for our next agenda item as well. But uh, on with this topic, uh, the question would be, uh, are there members of the public wishing to address this item? And anyone else who would like to speak on this item? You probably know the routine by now, but please line up on the wall and uh, I'm getting a good thumbs up, good. Uh, and we'll get you to the microphone next. <clears throat> Good evening. Hello, my name is Bernard, and I am a Fullerton resident, Mayor Whitaker, Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap, and Council Member Chung. You three made big promises to fix our roads, support public safety, and save the museum without a sales tax. Yet, here we are with no money for any of this and a museum on the verge of collapse. Were you just lying or grandstanding so you can get elected? For those who thought somehow that a dedicated sales tax for our roads is the answer, now should realize that our city has way more problems than just our roads. The museum is just one of many services that we are losing. At least honor your commitment to this museum and keep it open. Shame on you. Go Bruins. Good evening, Mayor Whitaker, Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap, and Council Members Zara, Jung, and Silva. I'm Janet Buzan. I am currently the president of the Fullerton Museum Center Association. I speak on behalf of the museum board and for our 400 plus members. Since January, we've had some formal and informal conversations with individual council members and collectively. Um, we were charged with bringing the museum back to life after being defunded. And I cannot tell you how many countless hours our dedicated board and other members of the community have worked to attempt to make this happen. We asked and wrote the letter to council so that we would be agendized for funding. Um, we were told that we were defunded due to COVID uh, we were not informed that we were going to be defunded due to monetary issues. Um, these things came as a surprise. Um, I was listening to the report tonight. Um, whether that funding be as part of the budget, which we um, had intended to be a part of, or if you intend to give a grant, um, we do need funding in order to be successful. Um, Councilman Zara has been attending um, three of our meetings. We are also working with a grant writer. We, as a board, through our own funds, have contacted um, Dr. Gail um, Ariola Nickel. And one of the things we're having problems with is funding, is funding comes from an organization who is going to be here for X amount of time. So we really need the support of each of you as council members so that we can 
attempt to secure some funding. Um, initially, um, we do need that to get started. <laughs> I think I have talked to some of you individually. It's as if we've had our legs cut off and it's like, when's the museum going to open? When's the fair garden going to open? We'd love for that to happen, but these things do not happen overnight. Uh, Ms. Alice Loya has been very great about working with us and we're very thankful um, that you appointed her as liaison because when she first started, um, I was on the museum board at that time, so she understands how complicated the work of the museum professionals that are now gone from the city was. We are volunteers, and although we're happy to volunteers, we are not museum professionals. We lost over 50 years of experience with advanced degrees. So although we can do the best we can, we do need some additional help because there are rules and regulations there are so many things that fit into coming back to being the award-winning organization that we, in partnership with you, um, with the contract, um, work together to achieve. So tonight, although my time is up, um, thank you for considering this. Um, I hope that we can work together um, for just not just short-term solutions. Thank you, Ms. Pusson. I'm sorry to cut okay. you off, but no, th thank you. But thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Hey, Good everyone. evening. Hi. It's cool seeing you guys like not on TV and in real life. Um, my name is Christine Buzan. I'm a citizen of Fullerton's District 2 and a member of the Fullerton Museum Center's Board of Trustees. I want to give my time to give context to what the association's contractual role is within its partnership with the city. So um, the two figures that were presented for you guys for consideration, I just wanted to reemphasize the fact that those two figures for funding do not include the cost of exhibits, programming, activities, events, independent contractors, or the cost of goods, such as gift shop inventory and beer and wine for the beer garden. And to clarify what Councilman Jung was asking about fundraising, on average, the FMC's board of, FMCA's Board of Trustees raises between $160,000 to a quarter of a million dollars, and all of those expenses are covered by that money that we raise. However, at the point, most of our fundraising has been on hold because we don't know if we'll be open or not, and quite frankly, that's fraudulent to ask for money from the public, from an organization, that it's unclear if we have the city and council support. Um, the above figures were included in the staff presentation for your review, but again, I wanted to bring attention to these points to highlight the contributions the FMCA board has provided in maintaining a partnership for over 40 years. That is a long time. That's longer than some of us have been alive. This partnership has brought education to citizens of all ages, a gathering place for Fullerton's community, and has contributed to the economic vitality of our city's downtown business. I'm sure if you ask any business owner within the downtown area the importance of the FMC, they will say the beer garden on Thursday nights. So I wanted to thank you guys for your time um, and for agendizing us, and I hope you guys will make the correct decision for our community. Hi, I'm Jim Rain. I am the uh, board um, on on the board. Um, about 25 years ago, we started a endowment. We have over three hundred thousand uh, dollars as we speak. Uh, t a year and a half ago, we did a proposal. Uh, the proposal was to spend about a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for two years, uh, along with. Um, along with some city funds, and that would be a two years that we could really uh, do much better, uh, basically in development and in uh, funding. Um, that has to be done. In, you need a you need a you need a, co uh, a concentration that's that's going, uh, an organization that's going uh, and working. And then you can get some, uh, some fr uh, fr excuse me, I have a stroke, so it's a little, little confusing here. However, uh, here, here's the deal as it goes. This is personal, okay? If the city says, okay, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice run and we're done, uh, it will be my recommendation to my board that let's take the money that we have and let's refund it to other cultural 
uh, uh, cultural organizations here in the city. Uh, th and that's, 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 the, that's where we are. We're, we're, we can use a lot of that money for the museum and do a lot of work, uh, but if we don't have any, if we don't have any money from us, uh, we, that that three hundred thousand dollars just is spent in a day and a half, uh, and uh, it, it, we're just the the, the the museum is basically uh, dead at this point. So thanks. Good evening, Manish Bharathwaja. Welcome uh, to everybody who's finally out and about and at a uh, actual public hearing. It's nice to see. I also wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, all of the council members. You know, some of you have been on for a little bit of time and some of you are new, but it's nice to see the, the growth from every single one of you. Uh, as it relates to uh, the museum tonight, I think that uh, there's absolutely a process by which this can work. But I think we also have to be considerate of the tough economic times we're going through. My family has really enjoyed the time that we got to go to Museum Plaza or whatever somebody's calling it at this point in time and going into the museum. It's not a big place, but it's packed with a lot of things. It's got a lot of history. What makes this town is going to be all the things that we remember as we grow up. My kids will remember going in there thinking that um, the, the guitars were made there, other silly things that kids come up with. But it was amazing to see. I would say that at this point in time, maybe we look at another public-private partnership. You've got Cal State Fullerton with all sorts of art students or whatever um, programs that they've got. Maybe there's a way to get them involved for the volunteer hours that they may need. On top of that, we spend a lot of money in the city and a lot of things that a lot of people may not agree with. But I think, at the very least, maybe we just support the grant until the Museum Foundation can fundraise a little bit more or maybe look at some kind of a uh, matching grant system. Maybe that's a little bit more reasonable. Maybe it's more palatable for everybody. With that, I'm going to cut my time short tonight, which isn't something I normally do. Thank you again. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and all the council members. My name is Kathy Campanelli, and we have lived in the city of Fullerton since 1977. Um, I don't think that what we're really talking about tonight, certainly money is a big issue, but gentlemen, you are talking about a heart. You are talking about the heart of Fullerton. You are talking about community. How many cities do you know has a museum? How many cities do you know that provide art and culture to your community? We are known as an education community. This commu this museum has provided hours, 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 years of education to our children at the kindergarten level, at the, the grade school level, even at the high school level. And we, I'm a docent at the Fullerton Airport where the kids come as, um, for day trips to come on a little field trip and we show them what the Fullerton Museum has provided as the um, the signage that's in their lobby area, and we talk about the history of Fullerton, how we began, what has been here, how Fullerton has had been um, instrumental in aerospace, what the meaning of Fullerton really is. And a lot of what's in that Fullerton Museum has talked about that. So gentlemen, think about the Fender guitar. Think about what's been done with the Fender guitar. Where did it start? Where are those guitars sitting? Talk about fundraising. The FMCA has been trying to fundraise. We had a dinner on our patio. Our social media is very, very active. We had Fullerton gathers. I hope every one of you came out to the restaurants that were hosting people to come and eat and donate part of that money to keep the museum open. We had the firefighters, thanks to, I think, Mr. Zahara, the firefighters, they collected money to keep the museum open. We had FMC and me. Did one of your family members paint about their memories of the museum and donate their panel? And then people came through and saw those 250 panels, and then we sold them. We didn't pay anybody to do that. They did it, and they shared what they have learned and known and love about the museum. Five-year-olds. 
five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 25-year-olds who came and painted about what they learned when they were five years old. And the Women's Club of Fullerton has donated. Gentlemen, think about your heart of Fullerton. And it takes money and it takes partnership. Please consider a grant or an option that will keep this monument to the city of Fullerton open for another 25 years. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Christina Garner. I'm a retired um, high school teacher from Fullerton High School. And I've been a docent at Museum Center for since maybe 1994. So I'd like to share with you gentlemen uh, that I think the language that I just heard that this is the beating heart of the city is very, very accurate. I want to compare this to recent travels I took in uh, formerly communist countries such as Romania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, where I saw a big arts district and museums in each of these countries that is recovering or developing um, at this point in time in uh, Skopje or in Plovdiv or in uh, Sibiu. So I really want to, uh, to ask ourselves why we um, can't have a, a city museum with the kinds of arts that we've had. I've taken lots of students there on walking field trips. Many of my students have never been to any kind of museum. And this was their first time. And it is not the same to have a virtual tour of a museum when this has never been an opportunity for you. And I could take them two blocks from the high school to see actual art, photographs of Frida Kahlo or the shark exhibit or actual tarantulas. And the things that my students at high school levels needed were cultural exposure. I, I'm frustrated that countries that we might have said, oh, they're behind the Iron Curtain, could show me a better arts experience than I can show them when they come over here. And I have also taken a number of international visitors over there, including French students uh, that came from out of town. I think that we could be developing tourism from travel a lot more than we are experiencing right now. So as I wrap it up, I just want to cite a Saturday Night Live skit that came out recently, which was, what still works? Well, the Fullerton Museum Center was working just fine. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Wishika, Mayor Pro Tem, Dunlap, Council Members, Silva, Jung, and Zara. My name is Harmeet Chan. I am one of the board members on the Fullerton Museum Center Association. Frankly, I'm surprised that the museum was not included in the budget because we do have an existing contract that goes through 2024, and renegotiating a contract does not invalidate the contract that's in effect at this time. So, um, you know, that's beside the point. We all realize I'm in front of you not only as a board member but also as a long-term resident of Fullerton. Um, we do realize the financial constraints on the city, and... What we need right now is time to renegotiate the contract, to find a source of funding to keep operations going. More so, we need staffing. We really do need help with that. So if there's some type of in-kind, um, some type of in-kind, uh, you know, that we can do rather than funding, that would be helpful. If we could have use of the plaza, that would be helpful. Our fundraising has been constrained by not only the access, but the immense amount of work that each of us have had to do. I work probably 70 hours a week at my normal job, and on top of that, have been volunteering on the weekends and trying to get things done that we can't, including maintenance, cleaning, um, everything. So anything that you can give us would be really appreciated. We would like to work with you towards a shared long-term goal of eventually becoming an independent museum that is self-sustaining, but that takes time. And like Janet said, we were locked out and our knees were, uh, what did you say? Our legs were cut off. So, you know, we, we just left out there. And as I run the streets of Fullerton and all the trails, I have neighbors saying, when is a beer garden opening? Because 
the, it's not just the museum, but it's the sense of community that the Fullerton Museum Center gives to everybody, and people are begging for that to be reinstated. We have done a lot of fundraising, and we are very excited about our upcoming exhibit that the board members work tirelessly to put together without any staff support. So at this point, um, anything that you can give us would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Harmeet. I could not have said it better. I'm Jan Florian. Good evening, Council. Uh, I, I have an idea where $75,000 could come to help fund the museum, and that would be from this ridiculous idea that the Council has fronted for vanity offices, something that we have not had for over the 100 year plus that this Council has been, that this city has been incorporated. I do have a couple of questions. One is, on uh, page two of the agenda letter, about middle of it, just the paragraph before background, it says there's also capacity from cost reduction measures uh, to reimburse the MFCA $51,771 in cost. And our um, deputy city manager referred to that. Does that mean that that is an amount that could could be reimbursed to the to the museum foundation in addition to your contemplation of a two hundred and five thousand dollar grant. Because in effect, you could reduce the grant by fifty one thousand, and you'd only be in for a hundred and fifty thousand, and half of that could come from the seventy five thousand for the vanity offices, if you didn't do it. So that's question number one. Question number two is what in the heck happened to the $34 million that the city has in a bank account to distribute COVID-related funds? Where is that money? And how come this council doesn't have a plan for it? You, This new council has been sitting here for six and a half months, and I have not seen any accomplishments with the exception of trying to overturn ordinances that the previous council approved. I was happy with your decision about Temple Beth Tikva tonight, and I appreciate that. One of the things that I was concerned about when I first saw the agenda letter was on the first page, every agenda item generally has a priority policy statement. And this agenda item says, this item matches the following priority policy statements. None. None. And yet, in the previous two agendas pertinent to this area, one dated February 2nd, 2020, the other dated March 16, 2021, the priority policy statement fulfilled fiscal and organizational stability. So what happened? Who had the change of heart? Was it a department head? Anyway, um, I would like to point out to the council that in my, is my belief that the support and the creation of cultural resources is part of our priority in this city. And that is evidenced by the city seal. Um, that your is your right time there. is up, Ms. Flory. The book represents culture in this community. Good evening. Um, hello, I'm Jane Sylvester quite a long time resident here. I don't know any of the financial information about the museum. I know that I have friends from all over the world that visit me and from all over the states. I have a lot of company. And one of our highlights is going to the beer garden, the museum, the music, and the and the market. I mean, it's almost like, like they were saying, that is the heart. And it's, it's, it's something special about Fullerton. And I have a lot of people that visit me, and that's one of the highlights when they come, that we go there, you know. I, I don't know how you can do it, you know, but I think there's a lot of people out there that would volunteer if they got involved in that to work and do stuff in the museum and help it. But it, it's like the town's dead. It, it needs to come back. That's, that's, that's the heart. It really does. It keeps the city down. You know, that brings business all the way downtown. It doesn't just do the museum, you know. I just, I hate to see it gone. 
because if the museum goes and the beer garden, I mean, it's just not happening. So I hope you get the music back. <laughs> Evening, Council. Been a while. Um, everyone loves the museum. That's always been the case. But we have no money. The museum has never been self-sustaining. And whether you fund it or not, I, I kind of don't care at the moment. Just in the long term, you really need to work with them to cut it loose. Because much to the chagrin of most people on the right, when they threaten to defund NPR or whatever else, the private sector steps up and donates and takes care of the problem. If I read the report right, it was like 4% of museums are funded municipally. We throw 600000 or something dollars down the museum year in and year out or whatever the case is. I mean, it was just we don't have the money. And ultimately, I think the people in the city would step up more if they didn't think that the city was constantly going to pay for it. People are more charitable when they don't think they can rely on the state to do things for them. Now, I will defend counsel after a comment from a previous speaker because, yeah, there are things currently that could offset the 50 some odd thousand dollars the museum's asking for. But I have a $60,000 check that you guys wrote me based on what that commenter voted on. So, I mean, really, you want to get into brass tacks. There's a lot of stuff over the years that could have been cut that didn't need to happen. Accountability, fiscal restraint. I mean, I've been at this microphone for years railing on these issues. So, you know, if you can fund it, fine. If you can't, fine. I mean, really, I, I looked at the budget you guys passed two weeks ago with the glaring million dollars size hole in it. So find funding, don't, but ultimately work with them as best you can to cut them loose as soon as possible because the only way they're ever going to thrive, they've never been self-sustaining. And the only way they ever will be is for the city to not be the crutch they can always lean on. Thank you. Good evening again, Mayor, City Council. Um, the museum, I'm just going to talk, you know, say some things. Uh, the museum, <clears throat> I think, is a good thing. And let me tell you why I think it's a good thing. Because when I was a kid, lived in Chicago for a while, museums all over the place, aquariums, but huge museums, bigger, bigger than the city of Fullerton. Seriously, many, many museums. And <clears throat> during the summer, when I would go to visit Chicago, I would go to, um, uh, I would go to a camp. I remember going to a, a camp where they put you on a school bus and they would take you all around the city, show you everything. Well, it was always about the museums. So many to visit every day, all the time. You know, so many interesting things. And when I came to Fullerton and I saw this little small museum that Fullerton had, you know, compared to Chicago, I'm going like, this is outstanding, beautiful, because I know what you learn in museums. That's why I'm a better person today. That's why I'm a great person because of the museum. No, you learn a lot. You know, so for the young people, this is not for you old people. You know what I'm just saying? It's for the older people, I'm sorry. But it's, it's for the young people to give them the insight on what the future is going to be, what you, what you had experienced now that you're older. So, yeah, do that. Now, the ways to fund that, I, I, I would say, like, I was a bus driver for OCTA 14 years. Become friends with OCTA. OCTA wants to build a streetcar right up and down here. They'll give you anything you want to sit at the table and talk to them. That's how they negotiate. They know how to get funding. Not that they'll take it out of their pocket, but they know how to get funding. They got people they hired to get funding. Okay, uh, the Continuum Care Board, we get $30 million a year on behalf of the homeless. We, the homeless, that's for us. We want to be a part of this, whatever you're doing in the city. Uh, again, let's go to the American Rescue Act. We just got $30 million for that. That is for the homeless. It's for other things also. And as a matter of fact, we haven't determined what, what exactly is, is all for. So we can't eliminate the library. They might be qualified, too. I'm pretty sure if you look into it, because we are a part of that. Um, and who else? The, um, uh, again, I, I just want to say, we, the library, to the young people and to the community as a whole, is very important. And if we can't do this little thing, what else is it that we can't do? And and I appreciate appreciate you, uh, Zari, for uh, Zari for you know going going all out and, and trying to make this happen. Um, and uh, Fred, you should work with him. He's a good man. Hey, but anyway, look, guys, let's do this. Let's find a way. That's what this is all about. And, you know, I'm like you know, big teamwork, basketball, football. We, you know, they don't go out with the, oh this. You know, they find a way to win to make these things happen. Don't just come up here 
and, and, and give up, you know, uh, Flory had a good point, you know. So let's, do, let's just do something, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more speakers, do we have Zoom comments? Yes, we have two Zoom callers. Um, caller ending in 1911, please unmute. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, um, this is Elsa Miranda. And hi, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to speak on this museum issue. I am all pro museums. I think um, it's a great opportunity for the young generation to learn and to thrive. Um, if you guys Maybe um, the city has gone with so many lawsuits and so many um, spending. And so, I mean, you guys have to find a way to create revenue. Um, I know the museum is hurting right now. We all hurting. But think about in the future how to create revenue. I mentioned before, open the Fox Theater. Do um, events, charge events. People are... I'm willing to maybe volunteer from the from college, junior college, universities. I mean, get everybody involved in this museum. And I'm pretty sure if you ask uh, community members, community leaders to volunteer, they will volunteer. But the city has to make revenue. I mean, there's so much spending on a lot of the workers and unions and everything cut it cut it a little bit and just put some money aside for this um, museum and we like to see more museums in the city we like to see more and less bars and less alcohol bars and licenses and of and obviously cannabis dispensaries so please um just consider that and have Look for funding, look for community leaders um, like myself into stepping in into keeping the museum. Thank you very much and have a great night. James Hiker, please unmute. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is James Hiker. I'm a 10 year resident of Fullerton and we have loved the downtown and especially the museum and their exhibits for many years. I looked at the budget pie chart in the uh, Fullerton Observer and I looked at the top five budget items. And I based my numbers on a $30,000, $300,000 ask, which sounds like that might even be less than the grant that may be under consideration. But if we spread that across the top five budget items and ask each one of those entities to participate by less than half of 1%, you can cover that amount. And it seems like now that maybe we're even asking for anything less. The museum represents the education community that Fullerton is. The Fullerton Museum Center serves all members of our community, especially the students. And that's been referenced by many previous speakers. Think about the growth of our city, think about the youth of our city and the future of our city and the importance that a museum represents in our community. It's less than 1% of the budget overall. Please fund the museum with the grant, give them the time they need to improve their relationship with the city and the community about and make this happen. Thank you for your time, I appreciate your attention. Eddie, please unmute. Hey, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to voice my support for the Fullerton Museum Center. I would like to see it uh, become a lively spot again after all this uh, gloom in the pandemic. But also, I would like to ask if it has been considered to rent out the beer garden of area of it to a local business that might be able to pay rent and help fund uh, the expenses of the museum. Uh, it's just a suggestion I thought of. I hope you guys all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Caller ending in 
854, please unmute. Hello. Hello. Uh, City Council, this is Tony Package. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm listening on the on the TV set too, and it's all you're behind and everything. Okay. Again, uh, good evening, City Council members, uh, um, Mayor Whitaker. How you doing? Uh, this is Tony Package. I've been a 17 year, my wife and I have been a 17 year uh, resident of, uh, of Fullerton. We have, uh, I'm right now, I'm very embarrassed for the, for the Fullerton City Council and staff. How could you not fund the, the Fullerton Museum Center? The Fullerton Museum Center is the cultural center of Fullerton. They not only manage the Fullerton Museum, but they manage the events at the plaza, the sports complex and other wonderful events. To not fund this valuable service shows your lack of concern for the Fullerton residents. We are slowly recovering. We are slowly recovering from this pandemic and need some joy in our life. And this an opportunity to celebrate the opening of California while staying local. We need this facility and its great volunteer team to create sorely needed cultural events. Do the right thing. Thank you very much. I'm, I'll be watching you and listening to you, and I hope you do the right thing. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Package. Matt Leslie, please unmute. Hi, this is Matt Leslie. Um, I want to ask the council whether or not uh, they know if they will be able to use any of the federal COVID relief money for uses like cultural support. I hope you can find some funding to fund the museum. Uh, and I wonder if anyone can answer my question, please. Thank you. There are no more Zoom speakers. Okay, with that, we will bring the item back to council and hopefully we can get an answer to that question as part of the discussion here. Is there any council member that cares? Yeah, yeah that question from Ms. Flory mm -hmm. regarding uh, Ms. Johnson, can you answer that? Which one? The one about whether that $50, $51,000 will offset that $200,000 grant they're asking for. How does that play into it? Uh, thank you. Um, Krista Johnson here. Um, it's it's my understanding, and I could ask Alice to confirm if I get this wrong. But the that is a reimbursement that the board has requested from the city. I think it would be it would be up to the um, to the um, association to the board if they would uh, if they no longer if they want to give up that request. But um, after reviewing their request, it is staff's recommendation that the city reimbursement reimburse them for those expenses um, that um, they incurred during that time. But if they'd like to put that towards, then that would be their decision. Um, am I missing anything, Alice? And just a quick question as a follow-up, if I may. Uh, and that, that, those monies are not coming from the general fund. Those would be coming from the, the first CARES Act money? Uh, no, sir, they would be coming from the current year budget for the Parks and Recreation Department, some um, savings that's left at the end of the fiscal year. We have a couple more weeks in June, and we have some savings in the department as a result of our um, very uh, deep cuts and reduction in programming because of the pandemic. But w is that correct? Yeah, not from not from CARES Act. Is there any any original CARES Act funding that could qualify for this that we still have uh, that we could apply for? Because I know we got a bunch of of money last year f specifically for COVID relief, and this could qualify for that. No. Well, um, sir, the there is a um, separate um, uh, American Recovery Act program 
that is um, set as, was established by the federal government for museums and large venue event owners and business owners to apply for. And um, um, the city's uh, legislative advocates, grant seeking specialist, towns and public affairs, has been um, assisting the museum to uh, apply for those funds. Um, but I believe that that pot of money, just like the other ARPA money that the city, which is a city program, it, the rules are still um, not um, definite, and so the museum board is not going to be able to, I don't believe right away, understand what kind of money they can get. But the CARES Act funding was from last year, and um, our administrative services director is here, and I could look to Ellis if we had any CARES Act money left, but I believe the CARES Act money was for COVID-related expenses. Um, the, the CARES Act money, when we reported both to the state and the county, was we used the public safety presumption. A good portion of the CARES Act money was used for um, pro programs that were distributed throughout the city, such as Feed Fullerton, the utility subsidy, um, and there was a number of other pro programs, I believe, that community economic development had managed. There is some CARES Act money that was remaining that we had applied to um, public safety labor costs. So should city council like to redirect some of that money, that would be at city council's direction. But the reason that we were using some of that uh, money for public safety labor costs, which was an allowable expense for CARES Act money, is to help offset some of the deficit that we are anticipating closing 2021 with. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. Uh, I think um, staff's recommendation of uh, reimbursing the museum, 51000 I think that can reasonably do be done out of the American Rescue Plan Act, that money that we have there. I'd also recommend uh, that we give the museum a grant for 100000 to bridge the, the time that gives them uh, um, 150000 to get going. Reestablish, reopen. It'll give us time as well to find the necessary funding long term and short term to keep this museum viable in the community. Uh, I would uh, make that motion, sir. Thank you. You know, I'll second that motion, um, but I, I would like to add because there's a few things that I want to touch on. So bear with me while I go through a couple of, uh, I guess, statements, and then I want to get into some, you know, dialogue based on I think um, some discussions that I had with board members and such. Um, you know, first, I think to my fellow Bruin who had commented about uh, items in the budget, um, cuts that can or can't be made, you know, the reality is if a, if a tax or other revenue measure were to pass without adjustments to the underlying operational deficiencies, we're going to find ourselves right back in the same situation. And so the reality is we're confronted with the tough decisions as to what to cut. And I think what's interesting is that as we look back at the meeting that we had, I believe it was April of this year, you know, it was unanimous on this council that we wanted to support and fund the museum center. Uh, and I think at which point, you know, we directed staff to work with the museum center board to figure out a way to get them up and running. I think there's also a lot of irony in the comment shared by a former council member, uh, you know, who's referring to some spending items that may or may not be discussed this evening, considering that, that council member voted to actually spend $125,000 marketing a failed sales tax measure that could have worked to reopen the museum center at that time. So getting back to the matter this evening, I think the reality is there's unanimous support from this council to fund the museum center. But the bigger reality is that we need to figure out a way to ensure that this cultural gem continues to thrive for years to come. Um, I, you know, I've got two little kids that I often take to the Santa Ana Zoo, and I, you know, you look at kind of what they're able to do with public funding, with grant funding, with fundraising that, that happens through sort of the donor community there, you know, in Santa Ana and also in Orange County, it's very similar to the Muckenthaler model that we have here in the city of Fullerton. I think something like that could definitely work, and we absolutely have to, I think, encourage that and, and nourish that uh, in, in the future so that we can have a, a thriving museum uh, that will serve our community. But as for the, you know, the motion or the, the matter at hand this evening, I, you know, I, look, I, I support funding it. I support getting it back open. And I think that's consistent with what we said three to four months ago when we were here talking about it. You know, not one person. I've never had um, 
anybody, whether it's in public comments, whether it's emails or telephone calls, you know, I've never had somebody say, hey, don't fund the museum. You know what? Keep the museum closed. That's not that nobody wants that. So I think the reality is the people have spoken and and we've listened. Mr. Mayor, Mayor if I may, um, I just have a question. I, I and I appreciate the the motion and and the second to the motion. But I'd like if if I may ask the question to the board members about the adequacy of the amount, it, because one of the things that we don't want to do is throw some money and then that money is not enough. And then, you know, six months down the line, we're still we're back in the same problem. Uh, the, you know, so I, I'd like if, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, bring out, uh, ask uh, Ms. Buzan to come out sure. and, and, and answer that question. Mm -hmm. Is is 100,000 plus the 50 um, adequate? The $51,000 was the reimbursement when we were locked out. We could not get to our mail so that we, ha we had to cancel different shows because we booked two years out. Also, um, there was a huge cost to return <laughs> a priceless item to the Roy A. Cuff Museum. That cost us thirteen thousand five hundred some odd dollars. So that those those were costs that we incurred because we could not even get to our mail. The one hundred thousand dollars would probably last like for a half a year. What we are trying to do is have the gift of time to work for a year. Again, the board. I mean, we we are looking at reducing the hours at the museum. Um, we're looking at who is going to do the staffing. Um, but there's just so many different components of that. In addition, our main fundraising comes from the beer garden. That's something that we developed. <laughs> it's like I, I'm that old that I'm one of the original people who put that together. So that is something that we're looking to get open to. None of these are really easy tasks. Like with the beer garden, there's a lot of liability that goes along with that. So <laughs> We, we're going to need to regroup depending on what you feel that you can give us. Um, you know, ultimately, it's like we're doing our part, and then you need to tell us what you can do. So, um, you know, depending on that, we can come back to you and at least with whatever funding that you are going to allow. Um, but that will be that will be reduced. We put together in the finance committee. Um, two of the gentlemen are here um, this evening. That's Jim Rainey and Ray Campanelli. Um, that finance committee put together those budgets that you saw in that April 27th um, outline. So I, I don't have it right in front of me. You maybe do, um, but that was that was based on opening three days a week. So I hope that answers your question. You know, I actually had a question. So I think the amount that was – there was an amount earlier, one hundred and sixty dollars to $200,000 a year, uh, it said in funds raised. Does that include money generated through the beer garden activities, or is that – or were those separate contributions or donations? Those were monies. A lot of that money was donated. Okay. That, that was raised through the beer garden. Those are the funds that we raise. Or if we have um, fundraisers, um, the fire department through Councilman Zara, you know, we received um, – some funding, and that was specifically for art for the kids, which we have dispensed that money already. Um, as I said, we're looking for grants. We got one that didn't require a lot of work, but it was, you know, small 5000 So those are things that are going into our coffer so that we can provide um, programming um, for the community and uh, hopefully um, edu art education for the children again. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes, Council uh, while, while we have you, uh, yes. thank you again for all the work that you're doing. I, I recognize being a volunteer of any sort is uh, difficult in, in the middle of a pandemic. I'm sure it's almost impossible. Uh, that said, the $100,000 would get you half a year, would get us here on the council half a year as well. Mm -hmm. My goal is to uh, incentivize the state of California, which has an ungodly surplus right now, is just giving money away, literally, to perhaps find... Uh, Somewhere along there, some monies to keep this open long term and help us along. Uh, I, I would assume that that money as well would help incentivize your volunteers to, to work with uh, the city staff to find a long term solution for this. 
Uh, do you find that six months would be adequate for you? You'd be comfortable with that, knowing that if indeed we have to readdress this in, in five months, that we'll go ahead and do that. With the museum business, of which I am not a professional, <laughs> I'm learning about professionalism, <laughs> even though I'm a volunteer, we have to plan out. And Alice, if you can, you know, as the, my, my city counterpart here, that's one of the things we've really talked about. So the museum board and our program planning committee has um, committed to two openings. You know, one of them, hopefully, that's going to take place in July, and then one that's the collaborative um, effort with Fullerton College, Cal State Fullerton, the Muckenthaler, um, and us. But these, but you've got to plan out in the museum business. And going six months is not is it's not adequate. We may not be able to find something to fill that spot. That, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, would it be helpful then that by that time we would have good direction from the federal government as to exactly what that ARPA money can be used and cannot be used for, um, which isn't clear right now. Uh, I, when do you when that's 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 what I call the Biden money, <laughs> right? The Biden money. So the right. Biden money. So I know there's the state, there's Cal Humanities. Um, you know, uh, you, you each of you is responsible, you know, fiscally to the city and to the other part of the contract. So I I can only tell you what would be great for you know it would be better to be able to plan for the year. Um, but, of course, you're the ones that have to make that commitment. That Understood. Decision. Thank you so Mr. much. Mr. Mayor, if I may? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, touching on, on the ARPA funding and the, the money being given away, uh, I, I made a suggestion two weeks ago about using some of the ARPA money that we know it's coming to us. The, the, uh, it, the ARPA money is it's, uh, targeted for revenue that entities lost. And we know for a fact that we lost – I believe it was 2.1 in sales re revenue, sales tax revenue, and we lost about a million in TOT tax. So, so that, that loss of revenue, we can take ARPA funding and put it in the general fund to cover that uh, lost revenue. Is that pretty much correct, Ms. Uh, Chang? I think we, we talked about it two weeks ago. My understanding from the current ARPA guidelines that are available, the interim and final rule, the Department of Treasury is still taking commentary on that, which will close sometime in mid-July, and then shortly thereafter, we're hoping for a clarification on guidance. To, but to Councilmember Silva's point, my understanding is that any portion <coughs> that we can substantiate at revenue loss can be used outside of four or five restricted purposes to um, stabilize um, or subsidize government operations. So, so my point is that it's, it looks like we're going to be able to, 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 you, to fill in the coffers that we were short up because of the COVID, and that's about $3.5 million. So I, I would like to see that put into the general fund to help us with this budget and allow uh, us to perhaps fund the museum for that year so they can do plan ahead six, nine, 12 months. And, and the other uh, question I had was regarding the... Uh, the, the maintenance, uh, where, did, where is it? Uh, the maintenance custodial, uh, I know that that's $113 million is budgeted from city fund to pay for that. But I also understand that other city buildings, uh, and I'll just say, especially the Richmond Community Center, right now the city is paying for that, but there's discussion for that center to start paying their own maintenance and custodial fund. So, so my point is if we're going to, pay the maintenance and custodial fund for one entity, we have to be equitable, equitable and, and continue paying it for the other entity. I, 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 don't like, I don't like the idea that we will cover the maintenance custodial expenses for the museum for a whole year, but here at the Richmond Community Center, we are, we're, we're negotiating, from what I understand, to have them pay custodial maintenance. Uh, and, and again, that doesn't seem equitable. So using these funds could help us make that equitable uh, proposition. And, and then from what I understand, also the, um, the building li and liability insurance, uh, I know I was told that the city is paying for the museum building and insurance, liability insurance, but uh, in talking to the Richmond Community Center, they were under the impression that they're paying for that. So again, we're paying for one and not the other for two buildings that the uh, city owns. 
So, so if, if we're going to do something for the museum, I, I think we should do it also for other, for our community center. And I think by moving that $3.45 million from ARPA funds that we are going to be entitled to, to fill that gap for re lost revenue, that would help us give you the year uh, and, and help us be equitable to the south part of Fullerton. And I would also ask that uh, you mentioned you had about 400 members. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and, and I would ask that we go on a campaign and have each member donate $100, and I'll be the first one to do that, to raise that 40000 and help you go further along. So, so I, I would uh, maybe make a substitute motion to move that 3.4 uh, ARPA funds into the general fund that will cover a conservative amount of revenue that we lost during the COVID that we would be entitled to use uh, uh, when this is resolved and help us help us help you get through the year and help us with our budget uh, funding because right now I mean well, the city council is talking about doing a three three to five percent additional cuts to the budget and some council members are looking at eight to ten percent cuts. And those cuts are going to have to be, maybe have to be taken. And we're talking about jobs here. Where we're going to have to cut. And I don't know if I could uh, really, uh, do I cut a job or do I cut the museum or jobs? So, uh, so I would move to move that $3.4 million in TOT and sales revenue laws into the general fund and then... Um, support the museum so they can have that here and uh, maybe in that time we like council member junk said we can look for other funding from california and see if that helps and it'll give you the year to move on but it would also allow us to be equitable to the other other community centers in, in fullerton so mr silver your motion includes the hundred thousand and the fifty one thousand yes okay well actually it would include the the amount they need to stay afloat for the year well, that wasn't Mr. Jung's initial. I, I, I know, but I would do the substitute to put that in and allow them the, uh, well, I, actually it would be the 200, uh, where'd it go? 200, uh, I can't find them. 200,000, 205,000. Uh, given that we move that ARPA funding into the general fund. So you're, you're fashioning that as a substitute motion, not a friendly amendment? Well, if Mr. Jung's willing to take the friendly amendment, uh, I would ask for that uh, I think we can fund the museum for the better part of the end of the year with the uh, 51,000 which I think would qualify under the uh, ARPA uh, challenges that we have in terms of uh, what the definition from the Treasury Department is in terms of what those funds can be used for and the grant for a hundred thousand I think bridges them across uh, in the meantime I think we can uh, wait on further clarification from the federal government as to what that money can be used for uh, rather than make it up as we're going along. I'd like to have some clarity from the federal government once and for all exactly what we can use this money for and what we cannot, sir. Yeah, well, I mean, again, this is for lost revenue, and it says it in there, and we did lose the sales tax and the TO tax. We can quantify that. We can say our sales tax were, were low. And, and also, that would also address the potential inequities where we're going to pay the insurance and the maintenance for one entity and not for another. Uh, and that, to me, just would seem unfair uh, that if we're doing that for the museum, we should also continue doing that for the Richmond Community Center, and we would need that funding to do that. And I, I would like to find some clarification on a couple points here that were made. One was a speaker who spoke about... Uh, Having a valid contract through 2024, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more background on that if possible. And then secondarily, I do want to express that I have concerns that when you let a facility like this go uh, dark for very long, uh, you know, I recall many years back on the city council when we were assured that the Hunt Branch Library was going to be closed for a maximum 18 months. It was going to be rented out to... Uh, Grace Ministries, and we're now approaching 100 months since that occurred. Uh, there are efforts to resurrect and utilize that still as a, uh, as a public benefit property uh, in the city. So 
uh, I would be concerned about too much disruption, and you were indeed hit by the pandemic and, and uh, by the lockdown. And so I do think some money should be forthcoming from that as well. But uh, what about the contract? How did this get disrupted? Well, the contract was uh, for a, it was, it was for, um, there was an automatic renewal, and then it was, nego uh, it was renewed again. So it, the contract is valid until 2024. We haven't done anything to violate that contract or be in default under that contract, which would then, you know, eliminate complete funding and eliminate us from at least being considered in the budget. So and this was negotiated or it was imposed? No, the contract was signed many years ago. Oh, actually, Janet Buzan was <coughs> the president at the time, way back when it was signed. And so it was for a 10-year term and another extension, I believe. I don't have it in front of me. But we did look at that contract very carefully, both um, myself and another attorney who is on the board of the Fullerton Museum Association. And when the old city, I don't want to get into what happened, but um, a new, a unilateral contract or renegotiate, uh, we weren't even involved in the renegotiation process. It was just given to us and said, here, this is what we're going, this is what you're offered now. And so our position has always been the contract was in full force and effect, and it was ratified by continuing performance under that contract. And so we understand now that you may not be able to abide by that contract because you do have limited funding. So we're willing to work with the council um, on, you know, a modified version of what was due under that. But a, more than half of that was for salaries. Um, and so most of the staff is gone. And w the board of trustees for the museum cannot function as staff as well. And the second question I had, I'm not sure whom it's for, but uh, it was stated that there were m there was minimal cost savings to going to the three day program, and but I'd I'd like a little more clarity on what minimal is in this case. Okay, and so those three days would likely be Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Is that what we'd be talking about? Okay, and those would be your highest uh, days, at least for terms of, of uh, yes, and, and actually generating uh, revenue, right? Because the market yep. is on Thursdays, and so that's uh, something that the community really wants back in the beer garden, so, yeah. Well, it seems to me that we have so many competing interests for the ARPA funds that I, I could certainly see that some of those could be utilized in, in your direction, but there are so many other uh, asks when it comes to that, that uh, to me some hybrid solution of going to the three-day and then trying to patch it up. I, I understand also the vagaries of trying to plan long-term uh, exhibits. Uh, if you don't have the financing underlying that, that that could be a real difficult thing to accomplish. So that's why, uh, as we're trying to buy time here, some of the council members, I think it's leaving you, at least in terms of trying to operate, uh, with, with so much uncertainty. And uh, I don't know whether I see the mayor pro tem is uh, chomping at the bit here. So. Well, you know, I had a question. We, there's been a lot of talk about the ARPA funding, um, so I would refer to the city attorney. I mean, that's not agendized this evening. Would no, in fact, the ARPA funding has, is not agendized, and I believe staff is still going through, uh, preparing for you, uh, an analysis regarding what is the appropriate expenditure of the ARPA funds. I'm also somewhat concerned about Mr. Silva's motion with respect to the transfer of funds because that's really not agendized this evening. And I would think that our city uh, finance director should weigh in on that issue as a separately agendized item as well. Well, at this point, it hasn't been seconded. Has, is that correct? Okay. I believe, I believe really what's before this evening is, as Mr. Jung and other conversation, is a funding question regarding the museum, <laughs> what that would look like in certain terms of the council direction. Uh, the broader questions can be re-agendized or brought back to talk about ARPA money and that sort of thing. So okay. just for clarification, whatever we decide, we cannot vote on to move ARPA, to use ARPA funding right now At this point in time, we, do, we have no analysis regarding what the availability of ARPA funds are. That's what staff is doing right now is right, analyzing right. that and going to bring back to you the approvals. While I think your comments 
are probably appropriate and the funds probably will be transferred. That's really not on the agenda. Right. And to my knowledge, the finance department has not formally made the recommendation to you. Secondly, with respect to what's on the agenda this evening, really reflects a desire for the council to give direction to the staff and the museum board regarding what funding they will receive in the next six months to a year, however you guys so direct. So, Mr. Jung, your motion also included some funding from the ARPA funds, correct? My motion was 51000 to repay the debt that's owed, 100000 additional to bridge them along for the year. It gives us time to get clarity and, and work with the museum board to establish a long-term And where source. will we get the 100000 Because that, that's, that's part of the discussion. Where do we get that from? It'll be for the general fund right now. Okay, all right. Because okay, because that's that, that is the proposal. So I don't really know. Where Mayor I'm Whitaker. All right. No, I. I thank yes. You. Thank you, um, Mayor Whitaker and, and council members. Um, I, in, in the agenda report, I did not list ARPA funds as a an option for the city council to consider to use to provide funding to the museum board, and that was because of that uncertainty regarding um, what we can use it for, but also per the city council's um, direction in your budget work sessions, when you asked the city, to, you, you, you indicated that you wanted to, um, to look at the ARPA funds um, as a whole and not piecemeal it. So that, that's why the ARPA funding was not identified as an option. One of the options I did put down was contingency. I did speak with our administrative services director um, just now, and one thing that we can do is put this on uh, when we bring forward the ARPA funds um, to the city council, we can have a, a, a placeholder there saying that the council had already indicated they wanted to use a certain amount of money. It's the 100000 plus the $51,000 um, and ear, kind of earmarked it towards the museum. Um, is that correct, uh, Ellis? Can we, can we do that? Okay, then back to the mayor pro tem. Did you? Get yeah. Well, the, the only other question over? I had because the the cost I think that we saw floated for I believe a year of operations was about three hundred twenty thousand dollars, and that included the full time staff, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, the hundred and fifty almost gets us halfway there. Obviously, by the time this kind of goes into effect, it'll be more than halfway through the year. So, yeah, I think we can start there, and and I think we're we're headed on the right track. So, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so there, uh, I, I, again, to the point where there's a couple of points here. W the first one is the issue of booking the exhibits all the way through the end of the year. If we don't give clarity and, and some sort of commitment that this is going to be a year-long um, um, effort, uh, then, then we're looking at shutting down the museum after one or two exhibits. Uh, again, so uh, I think that we we do need to make some sort of commitment to at least one year, uh, whether we a we allocate the money. We don't have to allocate all the money now. We could maybe uh, allocate some of the funds now and then review again in six months or when when we bring back the ARPA funds and we, we have clarity there, we can allocate the other amount. Uh, but there, I think if we're going to commit to, a, to, a, to a, an amount of time that is adequate to help them negotiate this is the other point we need we need to renegotiate the contract to release them from some obligations if they are to be financially and, and, and independent ultimately and we need to renegotiate that that all takes time especially with our staffing levels uh, so uh, I think a year of a commitment to a, to another year I think is is uh, is important so to the extent where we can um, make that commitment now but then we don't have to commit all the money now, and we can look at the our review this once we have more clarity on the ARPA funding for the other half of the amount. Um, uh, the other the other thing is, um, I, I'd like to look at if we're looking at long term. This is an issue overall in our city. Uh, other, uh, I, I'd like to ask to agendize a uh, public arts ordinance. This is something that uh, I've mentioned before. Other cities have this. Uh, it's a percentage charge to developers and developments. I've talked to many developers. All of them seem to be very open to this idea. No one has any issues with this. Uh, this creates a, a, an, an actual source of revenue for the city that would be dedicated towards uh, things like this, like you know, providing an annual grant for the museum, even if they are uh, independent. Uh, we can always offer this 
or to local uh, other local art pr projects that we can have. So I'd like to explore that as we start looking at so at long term viability for our arts in our city. Uh, so I hope I can get a second to that. This is separate and from I this item. And I would second that. Uh, uh, appreciate that. And, I think Brea does that, right? And Brea and, and, and Huntington art. Beach yeah. and a lot of uh, yeah. cities throughout California have this. And it, uh, Brea is a very great example. Their, their city you know, uh, has, has so much art in there. Uh, and so I think this is something that could um, help us uh, uh, over time. But um, as for now, I th I'd, I'd like to see if maybe Councilman uh, Jung would amend the motion to include that uh, the 205000 but maybe allocate the money now, uh, half of it now, and then the other half uh, at a time when ARPA funds have been um, discussed thoroughly. I think uh, uh, to uh, answer the councilman's question, uh, it's a valid question. I, I think it's something that we should all be concerned over. But uh, I, I don't know that any of us would disagree that our commitment towards the museum is not uh, bookended in a year. I think we would all agree with that we have a substantial commitment to this museum long term. So without the money, what does committing to a year actually do for them? It doesn't give them any more certainty than if they, I think if we don't have the money to give, uh, I think it'd be irrelevant to make the commitment. I think they all realize here and the public recognizes that all five of us sitting on the dais are committed to long term solution for this museum and having it for the public and in the best interest of uh, the children in the community. Um, I, I think what we can offer right now is certain monies in the hundred and a thousand and fifty one to pay. Hopefully that gets you through this year and we can find the monetary commitment necessary for a long term solution. But I, I don't know how arbitrarily giving a, a bookended time frame without money involved, sir, would uh, really help the museum and its uh, volunteer board. Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, just respond to that. Yes, I just want and to then clarify. I have a question once. Yeah, uh, I, I just uh, want to clarify. It, it's not to to bookend this a year. It is based on the um, the the uh, the ask that if if they are going to be booking exhibits, they, these exhibits are booked a year in advance. So if there's no certainty, if in six months we come back and say, okay, there's no more money, and they haven't had enough time to raise money because even the grant writer is going to take, they, they have to have the um, an, a certain amount of time to apply for the grants, wait for the grants, and we know these takes, take forever sometimes. And so if we're spending 100000 just to keep it open for, for six months and they can't book beyond that anymore, then we might as well not open it at all. It's just giving, you know, the the point is understood. I think what uh, you're, you're failing to perhaps misconstrue is we're not going to look at this again in six months' time, sir. W this will be an ongoing thing that we'll continue to look at. Indeed, uh, we have a councilman here that's been asking for solutions on this for from staff for the last four months, and it fell on deaf ears. You know, one, one question I did have, because um, I, I certainly understand your point about the, the year, and I guess to, I think, you know, Ms. Shauna's comments earlier, there's the perception or at least the understanding that potentially there's a contract in place that, you know, I think binds the city to another, what, two or three years potentially. Um, so, you know, I, I'd almost be open to, you know, a scenario here where perhaps, you know, there's a portion of money fronted, um, you know, with the balance due upon a potential renegotiation of the contract. And, I, you know, I don't know if that would be something that would be beneficial to the museum center in the city, but it seems like perhaps, you know, that could be, you know, a win-win as well. I'd be open to that. I, and I had one more question, too. The missing element to the funding uh, puzzle here is how much uh, would we project uh, you'd be able to raise in funds in that year, the year that we're looking going forward? Well, I don't know, but certainly six months is not enough. That, that's what I'm saying. And, and if we are to, again, can, can you ballpark a, a number at a least? I can't. What uh, could I mean, be raised I'm not potentially? The, I'm not the fundraiser, so maybe that's a question to, to the board. Because uh, certainly uh, something would be raised, and that's what I want to figure out is what part of the puzzle that would represent. Right. I mean, they are also raising the, they're continually raising their funds. Mm. Um, if we're, um, and I, I, I don't know, I can't quantify that. That's a very difficult question to quantify because some grants you apply for them and you don't, they don't get it. 
right? So you don't. So let me ask. I, I, you know, obviously I'm a member. There was no membership build because there was no. Oh, there was no no membership build because there was no museum open. Um, so assuming you send out, and you know, obviously this is public information anyway. So do you know offhand approximately how much you would generate from like you know membership? Do, you know, you send out membership dues or you send out invoices to existing members. How much would you expect to collect from that um, on an annual basis? Yes, and I would also say let's do that hundred dollars for every member in addition to raise that forty grand. That would be my other. <laughs> yeah. So we had actually been in the process prior to the COVID nineteen pandemic of reevaluating our membership structure. Um, if you were looking at the basis membership, which is around forty five dollars per those four hundred people who are our members, that would be around eighteen thousand dollars. <laughs> However, um, the board needs to vote on what the membership structure will be moving forward, and that will change those numbers significantly. Thank you. So, okay. So, and then I wanted to get clarification again on the whole donations, beer garden thing, because I, I just want to make sure we're talking to, you know, want to make sure is kind of putting together a like pro forma budget here to understand the financials. Um, so we're generating about $18,000 a year in membership fees, then another hundred and sixty dollars to $200,000 in donations. Um, any other revenue generated that um, should be factored in? Beer garden. Okay. Which is? I hate to make you get up again, but the people at home really want to hear your answer, too. So if you could please go to the microphone. It, see, council meetings are healthy. You're getting your steps in, too. So The net profit we get, the beer garden is probably our biggest fundraiser for the year. And it has, to be, to be perfectly honest, it has a lot to do with the Thursday night market. When you've had the, the beer garden, I mean, the uh, gallery all full, everything's been out there. With the way it is now, we can't. Ex I wouldn't expect that we would get the same kind of return on. But in, in the last couple of years, it's been about forty thousand dollars. Has been our net profit from the beer garden. And I, I just, I do want to remind um, just the our, our council members and, and folks the amounts, the amount needed to run the museum for a year is not six hundred thousand. It is more than that. So the amounts of money that you're using that you're raising is towards other expenses as well. No, no that's, that's correct. Yeah. Well, and also, too, it's important to point out a lot of the expense associated with the museum, it's not, you know, it's not new funds being spent. It's salaried employees who are here at the city. And so, you know, there's some, you know, I don't want to say redundancy there, but it's money that's going to be spent either way. It's just where it's allocated in terms of, of you know, services provided. Yeah, so. No. An understanding what you were talking about is the hundred thousand, whatever it was, to fund the museum going forward. Now, a lot of that is not going to be. We wouldn't be using that to run a, an exhibit that's happening right now. We need to be continually looking forward to find out what's going to happen in the next year. And a lot of the money that we would be paying a curator or a director or somebody, they would be looking at that, and they wouldn't have anything to do with what's going on right now. That's a separate set of expenses. Sure, so we just have an understanding for that. Mayor, Mayor Whitaker, may I just provide a clarification sure. to uh, Mayor Pro Tem? So the, the, the city does not have employees that uh, all those employees were laid off or moved to other programming. We do not have full-time employees that are involved or part-time employees that are involved with the museum right now. Well, They're not in the budget. Okay, rule of right, as of the shutdown. I mean, as of, as of the time, you know, the former city manager, I think, made the suggestion to shut it down. That's when, that's when that came about. Prior to that, there were. Right. So in right. the adopted so budget for the coming year, there's no city staff that is, um, that's budgeted for, for those purposes. So just want to make you know, sure okay. you know that. Okay. Okay. And, and we do need to release, the, from the contract, we need to release them from the provision that prevents them from hiring someone full time. Because right now, according to that, they can't, in the contract, they are not able to hire uh, an employee. They can contract 1099 someone. But then they'll get into all kinds of legal issues with the IRS, if that's the case. <coughs> Sir, we're going to be calling our city attorney at 7.30 tomorrow morning and, and getting a, a look at our yeah, the con city. That's a That should be yeah. a priority to renegotiate Absolutely. this contract and, and figure out long term with it, yeah. Well, can, can we maybe get an amendment to the motion then that would allow for that? I mean, because I, I, I would support that. I th it, it sounds like, you know, and look, I, you know, I had the opportunity to speak, you know, I know with um, 
you know, I think with Ms. Chana, with, um, you know, Ms. Buzan and, and also some o- and others as well. And so it seems like, you know, and I look, I'm, I'm willing to commit. I'm willing to pitch in as well. I, I happily see, you know, Mr. Silva's $100 contribution in addition to my own membership. But I'm happy to make calls and try to raise funds separately and aside from, um, you know, what's expected of the city to help get this, you know, to help get the museum center kind of self, I don't want to say self-sustaining, but so that we can get onto a path to, uh, you know, to progress where it can go back to, you know, putting on some of the quality <laughs> programs that we know it to put on. So, um, I mean, what actually, I mean, what do you, in terms of some kind of a, you know, a release or a renegotiation of the contract, I mean, what, what kind of timing or terms would, would be of, of interest? Well, it would probably be beneficial to us away from the dais to sit and talk to them and see right. yeah. well, how that negotiation might unfold. We, we did present some um, options to the former city manager, and I would have assumed that the city attorney had already reviewed the contract when it was – when one was quickly put together and basically thrown at us. Um, but we're open to – you know, a reasonable renegotiation, obviously, because we are fully aware of the fiscal constraints that you are. The biggest issue is staffing. That is the biggest issue. The volunteers and the members of the board cannot run the museum without staff and without assistance from the city. That would be... um, that's the biggest thing that we would need, where we would even reduce our demand for funding if we could get assistance with, um, you know, some maybe floating stuff to help with the beer garden, to help with the uh, museum store, to help install exhibits. So that's our biggest concern at this time, even more so than, um, you know, we wouldn't rest on just the funding. If if we could do, like I said, some type of in-kind exchange, that would even be something that would be extremely helpful to us at this time. But we're open to anything, honestly. And, and if I may, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, Ms. Johnson, at this time, that budget doesn't allow for any additional staff for the museum, right? Uh, like, you, like you said, it... it we no, no ha- sir. There's no there's no funding in the council adopted budget for um, city staffing, and my uh, understanding of the motion was that um, was for aligns with option D in the agenda report, which is to provide a grant to the museum in an amount determined by the city council, hundred thousand. FMCA would decide if it's able to operate the museum with this grant. No city staff would be involved in the operation of the museum, and then in addition. Recommendation number three, which is to grant their request for the one-time reimbursement. And then moving forward, we're also looking at another 5% cut, so that would be even more employees being cut, or maybe even a 10%, as it's been talked about. Or programs. Or so, so the programming will be, it's at a stop still. It's yeah. So that, that's my, I, and I want to make sure that we all leave here with a clear understanding of what the council's direction is. And so that's my direct, that's my understanding of the motion and um, I, if I'm incorrect, I, I'd please let us know now so that we all we all understand. That is the that is the motion available now. Okay, thank you. Right, and we will be calling the vote on that uh, shortly, I think. But it seems as though one of the exhibits that should be planned once, if we can pull this off, is a uh, patchwork quilt art exhibit, <laughs> to uh, because that seems to be where we're at right now. So I don't want this to be a confused. Uh, decision on part of the council is most everyone's had a chance to give their their comments. Uh, council Member Jung does have a motion on the floor that was seconded. Can yes, we? It was. Would would can uh, would the maker of the motion uh, entertain a friendly amendment to account for a potential renegotiation of this contract? Um, you know, with some of this funding conditional upon that. Indeed. Okay. And with that, I believe we're ready for a uh, roll call vote. Council Member Jung. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Zara. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dunlap. Aye. And Mayor Whitaker. Aye. Passes unanimously.
It's a beginning, at least. With, uh, with that, we're at our last item on the agenda this evening. was submitted by uh, Acting uh, City Manager Steve Danley. It was prepared by Krista Johnson. Uh, so I'm not sure what the plans are on presenting this item. We can give you a very short presentation or you can just take, take it from here, whatever you would like us to do. Uh, something to open the conversation would be good. Okay. Actually, Mr. Mayor, if I may, okay. I, I had a few uh, Concerns and questions I wanted to address first before we delve into this without creating fear or panic amongst our public, those that are sitting here and those that are watching at home. First and foremost, Acting City Manager Danley, I'd like to get some background from you as to why the proposal that's here is only limited to one, and it's, as far as I can tell, the most costly one at 75000 the museum, we had four options available to us, and that didn't even include the ARPA money. If you do that, that's five options. This had z zero, just one, not a secondary option to be had. What would be the reasoning behind that, sir? Uh, well, we looked at all the constraints we had about providing office space for five individuals, and this was uh, the cheapest option that we had. There was more expensive options that we could have proposed, but we didn't think that would um, fly. So um, this is the one that we put down for you to consider because of that reason. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. I had one other question, sir. If there are council members here that don't want a, an office, elect to not have it, then would that make this cost go down or negligible altogether? It would make it go, it, well, the biggest um, cost is for the single um, office space to be enclosed. So if we do that, that's $50,000 worth of cost. So that's, if we want to do that, that's there. But the other part to it, yes, that would take away um, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 off that price if we didn't need five offices. Because the idea was we, we, we just need one more and then city council, our city manager's office moves out and you take our existing offices that we moved out of. But if you don't need five offices, then yes, the price comes down. By how much? I would say 15 to 20. Okay, st still not at an acceptable bar ballpark number. Why does a city manager uh, move? What There are how many offices, just so the public understands, well, if, if, are, are here on the ground floor? That, um, that are in question, sir. I'm just trying to think of my head. <laughs> it's out of my head. But... Uh, if we, you don't need five offices for the council, then the city manager's office does not have to move. Right. right. And if indeed that happens, what's the cost, sir? Savings on that? Uh, it still all depends on if we build a second office. We're saying no. <laughs> or let, I'm, I'm saying let, let's give the option of no. We're not going to build anything. The option is no is then I don't think there's any cost. Right. Then. Exactly. Yes. And, That's and what I'm saying. Yes. Thank you, Council Member Jung. That was going to be my question as well is uh, we seem to be picking up on an earlier inflated notion from the prior city manager. And that was not what he was given direction to do. It, it was, in effect, creating a mountain out of a molehill, perhaps because he didn't want to make a change at all. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand that. But I do know that in the process of uh, developing this agenda report, that at least four of the five council members weren't consulted at all. And it would seem to me that that would be central in terms of identifying just what the ask was. Uh, the fact that this even appears on an agenda is, uh, as an agenda item is, uh, is very unusual, very non-standard to begin with. And this was agendized and turned into a weapon with which to attack what was a reasonable request by a majority of council members to the prior city manager. And normally, city managers are schooled that they need to be able to count to three. So these normally don't have to be, this is just moving uh, the deck chairs around a little bit. That, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, so I, I have great concerns with the way that this was constructed. And I have great concerns with the way that this has been developed as a weapon to attack 
uh, when it's a very simple solution, in my opinion. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. Um, I think this is a silly discussion. Uh, we have bigger problems in our city. We're looking at a $10 million deficit, roads that are terrible. Uh, I mean, the museum discussion alone, something that shouldn't be happening. And here we are arguing over vanity offices, as somebody has stated. I, I think this is a ridiculous thing. The reason, the genesis of this is that um, some of my co council colleagues wanted an office. Sure. And we all wanted office. We have cubicles. Um, we never, we're never here. I mean, I, <laughs> for two years, and I know some council members have been here for very, very long periods of t time, and business continues. Um, I, I don't see why we're even discussing this. The reason it was brought up is that there was some cost involved. Uh, the previous city manager um, uh, pr provided a proposal between fifteen to uh, $40,000. It is not as simple because the way the hall down here is constructed, um, and if you want to be equitable, if you're doing this, you want to be equitable to all council members, uh, which city managers should be doing, if this is the case, uh, then some construction had to be made to put a wall and create another office. Uh, that way it allows for five. Um, and that's where the cost came in. Uh, but I did not, I agendized this item and I believe Councilman Jung, you seconded it to, to bring it so to this. So why ask now why this item we're because talking about? It. We're talking about it because you agendized it. I supported because it, was it because, a, because it was excuse going, me, uh, excuse me, I, I haven't finished. I, I, am, I haven't finished. I, I am answering the question you finished. gave out, no. which is indeed, you said, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this. I didn't ask you the question. You uh, that was a rhetorical it. question, It's a rhetorical sir. question that I'm answering for you now. Wow! You can I can I can finish? The item. Can I finish, on, Mr. Mayor? Have some. Go ahead. Can we? Uh, I'd like to ask for some decorum, as you finish. had requested in the beginning. Finish, Council Member Zara. The reason this is brought up this is because we agendize it because I don't want us at a time when we're asking for austerity and using words like austerity and cutting. Uh, uh, we have no staff, and you're going to put staff to work uh, in the back, wasting time. I think the public needs to know about this. That's why it was agendized. Well, for someone who just voted to continue an extensive litigation that cost $800,000 to the city, that actually uh, helped launch... Not comparable, Mr. Mayor. Actually, you're just, you know, you're oh, just being very petty it's right not now, comp sir. It's not comparable by <laughs> multitudes of dollars. Sir. You're being very petty, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. This, this is a very, very petty thing. I would like to make a motion to table this item. Yes. I'll second. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. Council Member John. As our fellow councilman uh, admitted today, he agendized the item. I supported that because transparency shouldn't be uncommon in local government. That said, I take great umbrage at his remark that this is somehow a petty vanity project. Perhaps if he could comprehend the practicality of the request, if he bothered to actively communicate with his fellow council members and make it any kind of effort to understand the matter. But then again, I don't follow him on social media, so I suppose these things are too unreasonable to ask. But Buena Park, Brea, Anaheim, Orange, Irvine, La Habra, Costa Mesa, Yorba Linda all have individual council offices. I could go on, but I'll spare you the details. Not because it has anything to do with ego or vanity, but because there are common sense confidentiality and privacy concerns in order to effectively do the job we were elected to do by the people. Certainly, there would be segments of the public that contritely make commentary that council is a part-time job and we should set up camp at a corner of a library or outside of a cafe. That ill-advised flippant logic had a civil city publishing documents with confidential information in an easily accessible Dropbox site that cost the taxpayers a fuller to north of a million dollars already. And if this council member bothered to do the work deserving of the people's confidence and not be on a perpetual quest to campaign, perhaps this wouldn't be so foreign to him and it wouldn't be so puzzling. The sheer short-sightedness of his objection speaks volumes about his unwillingness to find confidence in the long-term value of projects and proposals, ironic considering that the same council member found no objection and fully supported a plan to sell off the City Hall building for high-density housing in order to build a brand-new City Hall 
with council offices in it. So if we're that was not about, an agendized item, and that was, there was oh, no I discussion see. on this. Why are you lying, Mr. So, Jung? Okay, it, I'm you, the one. You, that's I, lying. I asked that, I'm the Mr. One that's Mayor. Lying. I, I asked, you constantly right, fear no, monger the Mayor, public, Mr. It's Mayor. It's commonplace. All right, this is with you. out of order, Mr. Mayor, because these are absolute lies. These were absolute lies to say that having a meeting in a cafe or at, at the many amenities we have here, the city, we have privacy, we have. Do you think that is why there was a settlement? Because I had a meeting How are you equating else? the two? How's, That's not what I said. How about these, perhaps sir? listen to what I said you before you try and this. make commentary, just waiting to make commentary. Mr. Mayor, we have, I'll a, reinstate we have a motion. More. We have a motion in a second. If you wish to, to, to do this vanity thing, let's make a, take a vote and let's hear from the public as well. Yes. Well, then we need to hear from the public before the vote. Right. So, please, go ahead. Well, if you're going to use me as a bludgeon because that settlement was against me and the blog, I think I should talk on it. Um, you guys can talk about who voted for what. It was the previous council majority that voted to sue us and not hold staff or the city attorney responsible for what happened. But I don't see the current council holding the city attorney or staff accountable Mr. still, Mayor, is so this, I'm is not really sure how that's item on the floor? relevant. Wait, what was, am I being cut off? Well, I'm just saying we're, we're discussing city uh, the council right, offices. I'm, not... Right, I'm getting to that, so please oh. let me finish. Okay, well, no, I'm just clarifying. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But right. but council brought up the, the lawsuit against me as part of the uh, but, financial but still, issue between it, so let's continue. About item number 13. Now, as far as the offices go, yes, it is a part-time job, and honestly, uh, I don't see a balanced budget. So I don't know that it matters whether it's private or not if the job isn't being done. I watch council year in and year out, late staff and the unions in front of everybody and give them everything they want. I watch nothing change. I watch no real cuts happen. I, now, I watch no actual austerity plans. Hard decisions are never made. So I'm not sure why you get offices, whether or not other cities have them or not. We can all keep up with the Joneses. That's how we got into this financial mess. That city's fire department wants that, so we have to give ours that. That city's police department wants that, so we have to give them that. We, we play musical chairs with all of our staff as they do this all the time. That's how we're in a $10 million whole budget. So fix the budget problems, do your jobs, and then we can talk in better financial times of whether or not you deserve offices to sit in and woo and wine and dine lobbyists and union hacks at our expense. I mean, ultimately, I, I just don't see why you feel like you don't get to, you don't have to eat your vegetables, but you still get your cookie. You don't have to do the homework, but you still get a gold star. Do the job first. Balance the budget, get us at a fiscally responsible position, and then come back to us with projects that kind of don't matter. And for one final point on this, the reason it's being brought forward is because we, all of us who pay attention know that the city manager has a specific line item total that they can do without things coming, I think it's fifty or $75,000, that they can do without it coming in front of council. And that's how a lot of things gets, get hidden and skirted away and outside of public view. I am amazed that I actually believe, I actually agree with Councilman Zara on something because I don't know that that's happened before except maybe once. So unfortunately, no, it doesn't make sense at all. Thank you. Hi, Kitty Haramil, uh, District 4. And just a little, uh, little tidbit of information. Um, yeah, keeping up with the Joneses, that was a good, that was a good line because, uh, that's exactly what, uh, Councilman Jung means or says. Um, other cities don't have the budgetary problems that we have right now. I just think this is such a terrible time to even be discussing something like this so ridiculous. We've been here, Fullerton has been here for over 130 years. And never, ever have I heard this discussion ever that any council member wants a private office. You have, what, three or four floors here at City Hall. Every floor has conference rooms. You have the law library. You have the conference rooms at the 
community center, at the public library. You have a conference room right behind where you're sitting. You have plenty of spaces to have your private meetings that you guys say you have, or, or one person says you guys have. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that we're even having to hear something like this after what was talked about today, all the, the budgetary items. It's, it's ridiculous. This, and, and Mayor, you know, you, you reprimand us and instruct us to be civil, to be kind, to not be mean, and you allow Jung to spit fire every single council meeting without saying a word. I don't know what's wrong. Do you not see what everybody sees? It's ridiculous and we're such a joke. It's embarrassing. I've been here in Fullerton for 67 years and this is the first year that ever crossed my mind about selling my house and moving. The first time in my whole life Please don't make me take that step. Don't. Because I love this city. And, you know, you guys should love this city. And you should love what you do. You guys are up there to work for the city, to make it a better place for everybody, including yourselves, because you all live here too. But to bring these ridiculous things forward at such a dire time, it's, I just, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't know. Now I understand why people watch shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <clears throat> Look, first of, us, uh, first of all, many of us are troubled by the, um, I'll say deeply troubled, by the lack of decorum we're seeing. And this doesn't happen tonight. It happens quite a bit. Um, we can all disagree. I've agreed with each one of you, and I've probably disagreed with each one of you. But there is a need to have decorum and professionalism. We can berate one another all we want, but all we're doing is creating a spectacle. Getting back to the topic at hand, the discussion for city council offices has occurred for years and through many city council regimes. This isn't new. It is important for the citizenry to have access to their public officials. If you move forward with the creation of offices for council members, it is important that it is done in the spirit of public service and not for personal gain or for any sense of selfish gratification. If you vote for offices, then I would hope that you would also stipulate certain posted public hours that the voters, non-voters, whoever can come and meet with their elected officials. This would not only reduce the pushback of suspending what relatively is not, what relatively is a small amount of money for the benefit that it could produce, but it also creates access to our representatives. I know that someone recently made ridiculous comments about how much time our mayor spends at City Hall. I think that was pretty childish. I would also point out that he is one of the most visible and readily available council members that we have. I say this as someone who has clashed with Mr. Whitaker on several occasions. The other thing to keep in mind is that City Hall is at least 25% empty. If you move forward, it makes sense to move the city manager and his staff up to the third floor where redevelopment was. It also makes a lot more sense to keep council down here. This creates a feeling of access and transparency rather than a feeling of our council being hidden somewhere else. If we're going to move forward with this, let's do it for the right reasons. But please make a decision. We've been talking about this ad nauseum. But make the decisions for the right reasons. Thank you. I communicated with each of you. Uh, I'm sure you got my letter yesterday, or at least I hope you did. Uh, Molly McClanahan, I'm a former... Council member, 12 years, two terms as mayor. I urge you to vote no on this item. The city is strapped for funds. This is simply not a prudent use of public funds, not now or in the future. Serving on the council is a part-time job. It does not require separate personal offices for each member. The individual cubicles serve elected members well. And I can say that I have met with citizens in my home, in the public library, at a restaurant, on the street. <laughs> this is simply not in the public interest. And I just hope you will vote 
No, thank you. Thank you, Molly. I was I came here tonight to read Molly's letter to you because I understood that e-comments are not read to the council. But as an example, two of you, Nick and, and Jesus, you both have full-time jobs. You would not be here during normal business hours, and all anybody has to do is put a time-lapse camera on the parking spaces for the council, and you will see how much time city council members spend here. As for the mayor's office, the mayor's office has always been generously shared with all other city council people, and the city council secretary keeps a log of who needs the office when. If the mayor's office is not available, there is a large conference room behind the chamber here. There is also a beautiful law library, as Kitty mentioned, that will accommodate at least 12 to 16 people. You simply do not, as a city council member, you don't need to have that private space. There are private spaces all around here. And as Molly suggested, she has met with people in her home. I have as well. I have met in other people's homes. And so there's always a place to meet and do this. And if, if 100 plus years of city councils did without private offices, we can do without that here, especially climbing out of a pandemic and having to to struggle with the financial issues that this city has to struggle with. So I urge you to table this and not let it darken your doorstep again. Curtis Gamble, activist for the homeless and residents. Uh, Mayor, City Council, again. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm just going to talk because I like talking, you know. Um, you know, hey, um, let, let's just start right here. I, I wish you guys would get along, you know, just because, you know, you know, because you're supposed to get along. You know, no, uh, no real reason, just get along. Um, and it's okay if you don't because I, I, I like to see people sometimes don't, not in together. You know, like our other city council, kind of they were all together all the time. And I, I'm like, won't they argue with each other? You know, and they did. But I like this young guys coming in. I'm saying, you know, council. And, and that's okay. But uh, let me just go on. Um, I, I just think that the office spaces, yeah. You know, I'm just saying this. You guys deserve those office spaces. I'm just talking. But you guys deserve those office spaces. Because first of all, it's about the community. This is for, like, when I come to talk to you about an issue, you know, even I'm here tonight. I'm not here just because, you know, I want to talk. I have, I have issues. I have things. And, and sometimes I don't want other people to hear them. And I want it to be available when I want it to be available. And I'm speaking on behalf of the residents, the people, you know, the, the disabled people, the, 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 the older people. They, this is not just for you, not even close. This is for our community, our convenience, the community. Okay, now, <clears throat> the other thing is um, um, Mayor Whitaker, I apologize for putting you on a, 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 a social media, on my Facebook, saying that you want to defund the police. Um, that was me, and I will remove that. If I put stuff on my Facebook that you guys see that's maybe a little bit out of, out of the order, let me know. I'll take it off. But I post a lot trying to help out the community. The other thing, <laughs> well, no, I'm going to stay on this thing. Defunding the police would be the right thing to do. And there's many things that we mean by defunding the police. And it's not a bad thing. We always look at it as a bad thing. Mayor, but, um, I, I will need to have you stay on topic. Here. Okay, but the topic is you're giving a wave 50% of your budget to the police department and 25% of it to the, uh, to the fire department. You're only leaving the residents with 25% with budget. And now we're fighting over every penny. This is not right to the community. What is $75,000? I'm just saying for an office space. What is that compared to $50 million a year for one group of people when we can use social workers to do most of, the, most of that work? So, again, to get back to the subject, the office spaces, this is for you, but at the same time for the public. They deserve this. I deserve this. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you. Are there any Zoom comments? At this time, we have one. Okay. Caller ending in 1911, please unmute. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, my comment is I'm going to go with definitely with um, Council Member Fred Jung mentioned. Um, I've been to many council meetings where you guys are trying to spend $300,000 on just advisory, um, just to tell you where to maybe you need a, a water fountain in the park, or maybe you need some grass or trees and stuff like that. So $75,000 spent in the building for the council members, for our, our city, Aaron, just want to make a comment. Welcome to our city, city manager, um, where he's coming, you know, he's coming. We want to welcome you. We want, we want you to maybe change a little bit the outcome from our old city manager. So why not $75,000 to be spending in the, in the building? Once again, like I said, is not much. And hopefully, hopefully, that will keep a lot of the records, like Fred Jung, Council Member Jung said, uh, records closed. Um, and you guys have a maybe a better way to, to work in, in that office. I am pro 100% for those $75,000. And I mean, the gentleman that I spoke earlier, he, he won the lawsuit. And just a you know special thought, maybe he could donate some money also to the <laughs> museum. So um, no offense, no nothing, but it's seventy five thousand dollars. I think in the, in that, it doesn't compare to the lawsuits of four hundred thousand, six hundred thousand, or three hundred thousand dollars to the advisor just to tell you where to put grass on a park. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you. What, what say you, Mr. Ferguson? I know. There are no more Zoom okay. speakers. Uh, Bernard, I was hoping that you would have indicated sooner that you wanted to speak. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Bernard, and I am a Fullerton resident. Mayor Whitaker, you control the agenda, and yet... So far, you've agendized nothing of significance in the past seven months that would help our city. Yet, you think building frivolous offices for council members at taxpayer expenses is a priority? You counseled a cannabis ordinance that would have generated millions in revenue. You counseled an urban park project that would have benefited the community. And you fired a manager. So now we are paying double for that position. Not to mention driving out quality city employees. Public records requests have revealed that you and council member have are behind this. You both have the audacity to ask for public offices, private offices, while you're pushing for major cuts in services and public safety. Even after you lied to the people about fixing things without a sales tax, this is hypocritical, unethical, and you certainly do not deserve private offices, especially when I have fear of falling and can't even cross the street because of potholes. You have selective hearing, so let me repeat this. 
word is bond. That is how you differentiate between adults and kids. You are accountable for your words and actions. You said you have the solution. All I hear is questions with no answers. You are liars. Shame on you. Go Bruins. There were no more Zoom callers. Is that what you said? We have one that just raised their hand. Would you like me to unmute? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Sure. Caller ending in 4554. Please unmute. Hello again. My name is Tony Package. And I've been, as I said, I've been a resident of Fullerton for over 17 years. Uh, regarding your vain attempt to get private offices, how dare you? This city is bleeding red. Furthermore, you have deliberately laid off many full-time and part-time employees, increasing the workload of remaining employees. Plus, you have a hold hiring on, of budgeted vacancies. You, the city council members, are part-time employees, and as far as I'm concerned, temporary employees. Based on your performance to date, I am, po I am positive many residents feel the same way. Get this city running in the black. Vacancies filled and roads fixed. Then, when you, when you prove that you can manage a city, you can ask us to give you vanity uh, as a reward. Hundreds of city council members have faithfully performed their duties without this perk. Perks are earned, not given, when requested. You are especially for part-time employees. I assume you're all business people with an office space somewhere in a building or at home. Plus, the mayor has an office which, which can be used for private meetings if organized prior. There is a nice conference room. Plus, there is a no mention of equipment needed in the office, including computers, phones, printers, etc. So, do yourself a favor. Don't embarrass yourself. Give it. Just... just Table this issue and and go home. Thank you very much. Mayor Whitaker, there are no more Zoom. Speakers. Okay, we will bring the discussion back to council at this point. Mr. Mayor, there's a motion and a second to table the item. Okay, now we'll have some discussion then uh, after public comment. One thing I would like to address is the question of whether I control the agenda or not. Um, obviously, I didn't on this item because this item got agendized by two council members. But beyond that, whether I control the content of agenda reports is another question. This agenda report was not available at the time that we went over it, that we, it was in a draft form that was, there was no form to it. Uh, it was put into the agenda. The agenda was posted before I or anyone else had a chance to review or understand uh, what it contained. I think it's been established that it's all predicated on a $75,000 cost when, as we talk, as Councilmember Jung questioned, uh, there are ways of doing this at virtually zero cost. And that's what I would support. Uh, if someone said, gee, $75,000, that's fine. Uh, no, I wouldn't support a $75,000 proposal on this. And uh, that's where the whole thing has become distorted. And, and again, fashioned into a weapon. Uh, this, this was part of my comment earlier about council direction not always being followed. And that's where it's at. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may. <laughs> I would agree with you if there's zero cost, I'm supportive of this item. If it's not, I'm not. Thank you. Okay. You know, I'd, I'd just like to add, I hadn't, hadn't weighed in, but the reality is in six months as a council member, I know I've had the opportunity to meet with a couple people in here, and we've met either at Polly's Pies, made coffee, or, you know, I think it's uh, 
play coffee over on Commonwealth. It's a nice way to support local businesses, to be out in the community, but also to do the people's business. And I think the reality is um, at a time where we're talking about and looking at, you know, a deficit that we're, the deficit that we're facing, um, you know, and we're, we're trying to, you know, really, you know, cobble money together to fund important community resources like the Museum Center, you know, the idea that we would spend a dime on any kind of office space is just is is just absurd and so i you know i i do think it's important to note because i know even as in the comments or the emails that i got sort of in you know in, encouraging me to you know to you know not to support this item you know it's it's almost implied that because it was on the agenda that there was inherent support for the item and that you know in in my in my particular point of view that was that was never the case you know the reality um I'm trying to think of, um, I think it was Mr. Bard Washa actually rightfully noted, you know, this, this building's probably 20 to 25 percent vacant. If you look at office space, workstations, there's, there's plenty of existing spaces that I would think any council member that needed a workstation or wanted an office could easily, you know, plug and play a laptop or an iPad and would have immediate access to be able to accommodate meetings if they needed to meet at City Hall, um, you know, because it, in the event the conference room or, or the mayor's office were not... Um, you know, we're not suitable for that. So, um, you know, that's kind of my position on the item. And so, I, you know, again, I, it's not something I support. Okay, seeing no more comments, uh, we'll go ahead and call the question. Council Member Jung. No. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Zara. Aye. Council Member Dunlap? Aye. And I'm sorry, I called you Council Member Mayor Pro Tem and Mayor Whitaker. No. This motion passes three to two. And with that, I will turn to uh, Council Member Zara, who requested that we adjourn this evening. And Actually, I'm sorry, I had one thing. Mr. Mayor, I had a few things before that as well. Okay. You know, I would like to ask, um, have had some concerns brought forward about uh, farm animals and backyards and would like to direct the community development director to uh, potentially work on the ordinance that's specifically addressing multiple pot small animals. small animals sorry small animals okay thank you and council member Jung, you said something additional a few things sir uh, rv camping on walnut uh, requires our attention i'd like to draw city staff to come up with a solution same vein as valencia as well uh, an update on the opening up of the Soco Alley and the alley behind Revolution. Also an update on UP Park, recommendation for an RFP on the property. Finally, I've got concerns, Mr. Mayor, about the city hiring uh, Smith for cable casting service when considering a member of the board of directors of that company as a former city council person. How and when was this brought about? And I'd like to get an update on that. And I had one final uh, item as well, Sister City proposal for Tolo, Italy. It's been some time since the last Sister City was proposed. Uh, this is in a timely manner in accordance with the celebration of lifelong Fullertonian and, uh, well, much of his adult life anyway, Fullertonian baseball legend Tommy Lasorda. And I want to thank uh, the mayor and uh, Sister City's organization, Pam Keller, uh, for their leadership on this issue and look very forward to its progress. Thank you, sir. And back to Council Member Zara, who wanted to close in memoriam. Yeah, um, I think um, considering all the lives that, that have been lost um, and in their mem during this uh, COVID uh, in our city and elsewhere, I'd like to um, close with a, a moment of silence in their memory. And with that, this evening, uh, we will adjourn uh, until our next regularly scheduled city council meeting, which is July 6th. Three weeks. With that, adjourned.